Good morning. I would like to welcome you all to June's Dialogues in, in yet a different location this month. As the case is every month, the Dialogues, as you know, aim to generate discussions on a variety of topics and in different spaces that promote open engagement and free speech. The need to have a dialogue has never been as necessary as today, given that our times is defined by extreme polarization gaining ground. The simple value of I listen and talk, I respect the opposite side, and I come up with arguments seems to be threatened. Therefore, considering the need for a dialogue, for creating food for thought, and for the open exchange of ideas and knowledge, we started the Dialogues Forum in November 2017. That is a series of monthly events that focuses on a different topic, its time, and invites guest speakers from Greece and abroad, and also embraces you, the audience of Dialogues, that we regard as activate participants. These forums are open and free to all audiences and their intervention and active participants is encouraged. The speakers and you, the audience, are exposed to each other with a willingness to support free speech and open debate, as I have already mentioned. Among other speakers, Andreas Drakopoulos, the co-president of Stavros Nyarkos Foundation, who from the beginning believed in the dynamic nature of the dialogues and what it means to share your views in public, participated in our discussions many times, intending not only to share his thoughts with the other panelists, but also answer questions posed by the ones present. The target of this initiative is to promote a conversation and not individual hang-ups. To listen, to add, to agree or disagree, to argue and not simply to answer, but above all to reflect on serious matters that concern all of us. To empower our critical thinking and not take a neutral and uninvolved stance for what is happening around us. We have discussed so far, among other issues, solidarity, the crisis in journalism worldwide, the social and sociological dimensions of the signing world of, fo of football, the relationship between Greece and Germany that has been tested again during the last few years. Recently, we talked about the crucial issues that Europe faces. We were consumed with the daily li lives and the living conditions of the African community in Greece, as well as the global interest directed towards the African continent. We traveled outside Athens and we reached Thailand, Syros, where we turned time back to find the roots of the Rebetico movement. In a few words, the theme of the dialogues opens to society in order to create a wider community without limits, with a purpose to spread the views and thoughts of inspirational people. With polarization reaching new levels and the critical importance of reintroducing civil discourse and engagement into the public domain, in 2018, the SNF established through a landmark grant the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. The SNF Agora Institute is an academic and public forum which supports civic engagement and civil discourse that is the cornerstone of healthy democracies. The SNF committed $150 million to establish the and fully endow the Institute, drawing, drawing inspiration from the ancient Athena Agora, the central space of the city that grew to become a hub of conversation and debate and the heart of the city-state's democratic governance. So today, in dialogues, we will attend the SNF Agora Institute workshop and title Talking and Listening Across Divides. Scholars and professionals from various fields will participate in this workshop. Now, I would like to invite here on the stage Elizabeth Smythe, Executive Director of the SNF Agora Institute. We are looking forward for today's discussion. Thank you, Anna Kinthea. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here, and welcome to the second annual SNF Agora Institute Workshop. 
We are so pleased to be here. Um, and I want to take a quick moment to say thank you to the entire team at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, who has made not only this day, but this whole week of amazing events possible. Um, these are the people behind the scenes who do incredible amounts of work um, that none of us know about, but that makes this all come to life. So Asimenia and Elenia, Lania, Nancy, Stelios, Vasili, um, the whole team, we appreciate so much all that you've done to make this come to life. Um, what a gift to all of us to be able to communicate, listen, and learn, and celebrate in this incredible environment, um, and in this great city whose ancient agora inspired our very founding. Before we get started, um, I wanted to reflect quickly on the year we've had since we were last on stage. This was a year in which the SNF Agora Institute began laying the foundation uh, for the work ahead, starting with our workshop here in Athens last summer on disrupting polarization, and ending with the very exciting hire of our inaugural director, Hari Han, uh, from whom you will hear shortly. So quickly, I want to share a video with you uh, to give you some sense of the, the work that we've done this past year. You are not in an authentic dialogue with another human being. You cannot even come to know your full self. One of the best ways to understand disinformation is that there are several different levels of it, and there are sort of different levels of falseness. Last night, I sat down with governors from three states. We can choose to focus on those things that make us different, or we can choose to focus on the areas where we might actually be able to find common ground. In spite of how divided we are, there really is more that unites us. Uh, as Americans than, than that which divides us. Just because we're in a polarizing point right now doesn't mean we should give up on the system. Be part of that solution. We gotta have these conversations and I understand it's painful, but if not now, when? Once strong liberal democracies are subject to backsliding at an alarming rate. What we must have is a commitment to the highest level of truth. The thing that drives all of us is the spirit of inquiry. The scary thing is I can't stand here tonight and tell you our democratic system is going to work the way it has. to inspire a new generation to believe in the power of individual freedom and of free societies. This is a spark and we need your help to fan it into a flame. So today, as part of the SNF Dialogues monthly workshop, we're excited to share with all of you a series of conversations that are going to explore an issue that's at the heart of the work of our institute creating space for discussion and dialogue, even when we disagree. Around the world, people are finding it increasingly difficult to navigate conversations with whom they disagree, whether it's on the global stage, on issues of trade, the local stage, on issues of education, or even at the holiday dinner table with relatives from different parts of the country and on different sides of the political spectrum. Conversations are fraught, tensions are high, and issues are left unresolved. But democracy demands discourse. And today's panelists have something to teach all of us about how to engage in productive discourse. When the stakes are high and the participants are adversarial, they're gonna show us how to talk across divides so that we can foster better, more productive dialogue amongst institutions and individuals. But to kick things off, I'd like to welcome to the stage our inaugural director for the SNF Agora Institute, Hari Han, a Harvard and Stanford educated scholar who has dedicated her career to understanding political and civic participation and engagement, and who strives to find a way to make her academic work relevant in the world beyond campus, one of the critical pillars of the Agora Institute. Hari truly embodies the values that our institute aspires to promote 
She's known not only for her excellence in scholarship, but also for her work in practice in Washington and beyond. And most importantly, she's known for her boundless energy, her strategic vision, and the exceptional collegiality that marks everything she does. She is exactly the right leader at exactly the right time for this important initiative. I could go on to list all the groups she works with, the committees she steers, and the accolades she's garnered, but I think we'd rather just hear from her now. And so I'm pleased to welcome Hari Han to the stage to kick off this program to tell you a little more about her research and to share her vision for the work ahead for the SNF Agora Institute. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, come on, friends. I think we can do better than that. Good morning. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all this morning. Um, I want to start just by thanking Andreas and the whole team at the Stavros Niarcos Foundation for making today possible and really the entire week of activities that we've all been here today. Um, I also want to thank, give a special thanks to Elizabeth Smythe and also Carol Glagola, who have both worked tirelessly, not only in the past couple of weeks, but throughout the year to make possible um, the events and the panels of today. They really deserve all the credit for all the work and um, the discussions that we're going to have. And most of all, I want to thank all of you who are here this morning. I know some of you had a late night last night, and so I appreciate you waking up this morning and coming out to join us here this morning for really, I think, what really will be an extension of a lot of the stimulating and thought-provoking conversations that we've heard over the past couple days. Um, it's particularly relevant that we're here today um, before the um, gathered here in Athens, right close to the ancient Agora, which is really the birthplace of modern democracy. And I want to return to why the Agora is so relevant to the conversations that we're going to have today. But I'd rather start by telling you a little bit of a story to um, introduce you a little bit to myself. So um, I grew up as a daughter of Korean immigrants in Texas. And um, I grew up in a very kind of vibrant, uh, multiracial, multi-ethnic immigrant community. And like many kids of immigrants, I grew up learning how to sort of bridge difference with people who are different from me. And I want to tell you about one of my friends, my friend Kelly. So Kelly and I have been friends together since we were six years old. Um, we first became friends when our first grade teacher, Miss Ruska, suggested that we sit next to each other because she thought that we might be friends. And little did Miss Ruska know how accurate she would be. Um, Kelly and I grew up, we shared sleepovers, play dates, birthday parties, all the things that kids do. Um, we pulled each other's hair, we dressed up for Halloween, we went to the annual Texas rodeo together. And um, even though we went to different colleges, we never really lost touch. So um, Kelly was a maid of honor in my wedding. I was a maid of honor in her wedding. And most recently, we flew across the country to sort of share our birthdays, our 40th birthdays together. And um, I tell you this story because even though Kelly and I grew up being um, sharing a lot of things together, we've always disagreed politically. So when we were younger, we used to, in fact, make lists of things that we shared. Um, we both have short moms. Um, we both hate spaghetti, we both love to read, um, we both hate practicing piano. Apparently we can't spell practicing very well, so neither of us are very good spellers when we were younger. Um, but, you know, we always sort um, you know, kind of had these things that we had in common, but also things that we um, disagreed about. And so after college, um, my first job was working for a Democratic senator in New Jersey, Bill Bradley. And um, I had the privilege of working not only on his presidential campaign in 2000, but on the Obama campaign in 2008 and on the Obama-Biden transition team in 2009. And I remember going to visit Kelly um, in Virginia when I was uh, working on the transition team. Kelly, meanwhile, took a very different path. Um, after college, she went to work for an electronics company called Circuit City, and then she became a CPA, and now works for a big energy company in Virginia. And when we were younger, we used to sort of spend time on the phone kind of working out our political views together. So um, I'm sure some of you will remember those old phone cords that used to get twisted up all the time when you talked. And my kids can't imagine them, but I remember lying on the, my bedroom floor kind of twisted up in the phone cord, you know, debating with Kelly about different political topics. And 
to me, this story is particularly relevant to um, the conversation that we're having today because it really sets up the panel you know, about talking and listening across divides because statistically speaking, the kind of friendship that Kelly and I have is not as common now as it used to be when I was younger. So data from the Pew Research Center shows us that Americans on both sides of the political aisle are increasingly likely to see people from the other side as a threat. Right? So imagine what it's like to see the people around you as a very threat to your country. And I look at this data and I sort of think, you know, I wonder if I had met Kelly now as opposed to when we were kids 20 years ago or 30 years ago, would we see each other as threats? Right? Would we focus on the, our common humanity, spaghetti, piano, books, things that brought us together, or would we focus on the things that really drove us apart? And um, one of the things I think that is so important to thinking about this conversation is that when Kelly and I were friends, you know, as we were learning to sort of grow up together, we never obscured our differences. We never ignored our differences under the guise of some kind of false civility or anything like that. Instead, we were as clear about what we disagreed about as what we shared, right? Because it was through that sort of conversation that we learned to negotiate a friendship out of um, what we both had in common and what we disagreed about. And that brings me back to the Agora. We cannot really talk about the rise in affective polarization and parochialism around the world without thinking about the Agora. And the reason for that is because the Agora laid a crucial foundation for democracy and making modern democracy possible. And so why was it so crucial? So to understand why it was so crucial, um, I want to draw on the work of a um, Stanford political theorist, Josiah Ober, who talks about that answering this question about why the Agora was so crucial to democracy depends first on understanding what democracy is. So often nowadays, people have begun to think about democracy as majority rule, right? It's a voting rule that helps us decide what we want to do together. And he argues that democracy actually wasn't just about voting rule and it's a voting rule in its original conceptions, right? Instead, if you go, I mean, those of you who speak Greek don't need me to tell you that, you know, democracy is really the composite of two words, demoskratia, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, right? But when put together, it means people power. And power in that original sense was about the capacity of people to act. Right? So when we think about democracy in its original formulation, it was about sort of the capacity of people to act together. And that's why the Agora was so important, because the Agora was the place where people came together to develop the capacities to learn to act together in the ways that they needed to make democracy work. And so what's so interesting about Ober's work is that what he finds is that, you know, Athens was sort of one of many kind of little political experiments that were going on across classical Greece, where there are all sorts of different experiments for how we sort of structure democracy. And on most measures of society, um, the Athenian democracy did quite well, socially, politically, economically, militarily. It was really quite successful. And Josiah Arbers over argues that the success came not only um, as by accident, right? It wasn't just an outlier, but instead it was really grounded in choices that Athens had made about how they wanted to design their governmental system, how they wanted to sort of use the Agora as a foundation for making that government work. And that part of what, part of what differentiated Athenian democracy from other city-states around classical Greece was the fact that it had this Agora, right? And was the fact that it had this place where people came together where they were people who were different and learned how to disagree with each other, and there was a structured forum for debate and deliberation through which we could form the capacities that then made the kind of governance possible. And so as we confront all the threats to democracy around the world today, threats that you don't really need me to rehearse, and we think about this challenge of identifying, strengthening, and developing solutions, to dealing with it, dealing with those challenges, I think the question that the Agora really poses for us is what choices can we make now in the 21st century to realize democracy's promise, 
right? What are the choices that we can make about how we want to design the spaces, the agora-like spaces and the institutions that we have to make possible the democracy that we want? And so that question, or a form of that question, has really been in um, the backdrop of my work for many years. So my work has always been dedicated to trying to understand um, how we make the participation of ordinary people possible, probable, and powerful. So I've always wanted to understand how is it that we pull people off the sidelines of public life, right? How is it that we cultivate their interests, their motivations, their desires to want to engage with each other? And then finally, um, how do we make that matter? Right? Democracy is not just about people taking action, but it's about people taking action in a way that actually allows them to have voice over the outcomes that they care about. And so most of my work has been um, in the United States. Um, I, you know, having grown up as a daughter of immigrants, I think that I was always really interested in this whole idea of America. <laughs> right? well, how, it, what is this thing called America and how does it work? And so I've dedicated my work to understanding a lot of um, organizations in that space, but you know, I've had the privilege of being able to do the work in partnership with organizations all over the world, from environmental organizations in the United States to um, an evangelical church in the Rust Belt of Ohio, um, trying to understand how it is that we sort of bridge people across race. Um, and some of the questions that have animated this work have really been about trying to understand what I sort of think of as the North Star behind this, which is how do we strengthen the capacity of organizations all over the world to act what Tocqueville used to call as the great free schools of democracy? And one of the things that I've learned, both from my own research but also from my work in politics, is that the idea that, you know, as humans, we are not born, right, with the capacities for what it takes to engage in democratic society, but instead, those capacities are cultivated. And that's why these great free schools, like the Agora, are so important to us. And so, um, to give you a glimpse a little bit of some of the work that I've done, I just wanted to sort of introduce one study. Um, so this is a study that um, I did sort of starting in the kind of like mid-2000s or something like that. And it began with um, a paradox that I was seeing, or that a lot of us were seeing all over the world. And so here's the paradox. On the one hand, it felt like we had the rise of these new digital technologies that were making possible more participation than ever before, right? It was easier than it ever had been before to get hundreds of thousands of people to take action, right? But at the same time, as I was talking to people who are on the front lines of the organizations that were leading that kind of work, they were saying, it is true, right, that it's easier than it ever has been for us to get people involved, but we feel more powerless than ever before. Right? And so they pointed to stories like um, the Arab Spring, where with a Twitter handle and a Google Doc, um, they were able to get hundreds of thousands of people out into Tahrir Square to topple, um, to topple the Mubarak regime. Right? But then a few years later, you fast forward and the military is back in power. And I think it was that paradox that we were really trying to understand, which is how is it that you get people involved in ways that not only get them to take action, but get them to take action to sort of build power over the things that they really care about. And so I set up a study, the study was in the United States, where we compared organizations that were really good at getting people involved, right, in, in the sustained ways that we were interested in with organizations who weren't, right? And we were trying to think, even as these organizations are working with similar kinds of people, right, in similar kinds of communities, on similar kinds of issues, why is it that some of them are different from others, right? And so the, um, I don't want to spend too much time on the data or bore you too much this early in the morning, but you know, basically what the graph on the left shows is that when we first started studying the people who were joining these organizations, in the beginning, their levels of political interest and their levels of participation were really quite similar to each other. Right? They weren't that, the people who joined were not that different from each other. But then we sort of followed them over a year, and what we found is that based on the kind of organization they joined, their level of participation really differed in a big way, right? Organization, people who joined organizations that happened to be these high engagement organizations were much more likely to have gotten involved and stay involved over time than people who didn't. And so that taught us sort of an important lesson, which really is about this idea that organizations, they're not just neutral repositories, 
right, for generating action, but in fact, they can make choices about how they want to engage people in public life. And those choices crucially determine the ways and the level at which people participate. And so, just to describe an example of sort of what some of those choices are, I just want to tell you a story of a gentleman named Alex Waters. Okay, so Alex Waters, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of him because there's been a little bit of um, news about him in, in different circles, but Alex Waters grew up in the Midwest part of the United States. Um, when he was younger, he thought he wanted to be a professional golfer, right? So he went to college thinking he was going to be a professional athlete. And one weekend, he's at college, he went to school in Iowa, and um, one of his friends said, hey, you know, a bunch of us are going to go to my parents' lake house for the weekend. Do you want to come? And he thought, sure, right? I mean, when you're a college freshman, like, what could be better? I'm going to go to a friend's lake house for the weekend. So he goes off to his, this lake house with a bunch of his friends for the weekend. And one evening, he's standing at the end of the dock by a lake. Okay? And it's a little bit windy, and he's talking to some of his friends. He's got a baseball cap on. It's his favorite baseball cap. The wind comes by, and it blows the cap off his head into the water. And he thinks, shoot. I really love that baseball cap. What am I going to do, right? So he looks at the cap in the water, and he thinks, you know, a good baseball cap is really hard <laughs> right, to give up. Right? Once it's formed to your head just right, you don't want to give it up. So I'm going to dive in the water, and I'm going to get that cap. And he thought the water was maybe three meters deep, right? But it turns out the water was not. It was, about, it was probably more like half a meter deep. And so he dove into the water, right? And you can kind of imagine what happened next, right? He, was in, he um, snapped his spinal cord. He ended up having to be life lighted out of there. And it took several years of rehab, right, for him to recover. Um, he was quadriplegic, right? He was confined to a wheelchair after that. Um, and you fast forward a few years, and he was back in college, but his life was very different at that point, right? Because his dreams of becoming a professional golfer had changed. And he was trying to think, okay, here I am back in college, but what is it that I want to do? Who is it that I want to be? And during that time, there was a young senator from um, Illinois, Barack Obama, who began to run for president. And some of you may know, you know, Iowa is one of the states where presidential elections um, begin in a lot of ways. And so they were looking for field organizers around the United States. And the Obama campaign reached out to Alex and they said, hey, we want to hire you as a field organizer. And Alex said, you want to hire me as a field organizer? I mean, you know, I, I really like your guy and I think he's great and I hope he wins, but I can't be a field organizer. And they said, why? And he said, well, I can't do any of the things that field organizers do. And they said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you know, I can't, um, I can't walk a neighborhood. I can't knock on doors. I can't dial phone numbers on a phone, right? I can't do any of the things that organizers are supposed to do. And the Obama campaign said, you know what? You're misunderstanding what we want organizers to do, right? What you're thinking about is a traditional campaign where what we do is we hire a bunch of 22-year-olds and we work them to the bone, right? Asking them to essentially become voter contact machines, right? Where all they're doing is in the months leading up to the election, just spending you know, weeks and weeks of their time dialing phone numbers and knocking on doors and talking to every voter they possibly can. Right? They said, we're running a different kind of campaign. The campaign that we're going to run is one in which your job is not to constantly just reach out to and try to activate people who are already interested and engaged around Senator Obama, then Senator Obama, right? But in fact, your job right, is to identify, recruit, and develop the leadership of people who live in the communities that you're organizing cultivate their capacity to work with each other to begin to engage their neighbors in support for the president, right? And so it's a neighbors talking to neighbors. And the difference really between what Alex thought he was going to do and what he ended up doing is one of the key differences that we found in our research, um, what we call the difference between sort of mobilizing and organizing, about what differentiates organizations that are consistently able to sort of speak into that paradox, right, and get people involved in the sustained ways that we want, that bridge across difference, that sort of get them involved over and over again from the organizations that weren't, right? And it was those kinds of choices that not only the Obama campaign, but lots of organizations that we've been able to study that have really helped us understand how it is that we can create organizations that um, make good choices about how we engage people, right? Because how we engage people matters, right? If we treat people like consumers, they're going to treat people, they're going to treat politics like cereal, <laughs> right? But if we engage people as real agents, right, of democracy and cultivate their capacities, what we've found in working with organizations 
um, all over the world and you know, on many different issues and across the political aisle, is that there's a hunger that people have to want to engage in public life and in shaping their communities and their world in important ways. And so, you know, the work that I do is really one part of, um, you know, a much bigger set of questions that we're going to be looking at in the Agora Institute, right? I'm interested in this question of how we strengthen these Agora-like organizations to engage people in public life and deliberate in the ways that we want them to. But um, that's just, you know, one part of what makes democracy work. Um, I'm part of a commission at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on Citizenship and Democratic Practice. And that commission, what it tried to do is bring together leading thinkers and practitioners and elected officials and stakeholders from across the United States to try to understand how is it that we can rebuild right, the foundations of democracy, not in a way that is partisan, but in a way that is about sort of restoring faith in the democratic process itself. And they argue, this commission argues, that there's sort of a virtuous cycle that can emerge between civil society, political institutions, and political culture. Now, we could debate about the words, right? Some people might say that it's the sort of virtuous society between the norms and the practices and the institutions of democracy. But I think what's the core of the idea, the kernel of the idea that there's this virtuous cycle that we can create, right, and strengthen to sort of make democracy resilient to the kind of threats that we see around the world is right. And that's part of the reason that I'm so excited about what we're going to be working on at the SNF Agora Institute. Because the Institute, as many of you know, is really about sort of doing work that is integrative in that way, that speaks to strengthening the foundations of that virtuous cycle that we're describing. And so the Institute is really built on this idea of three pillars, right? At the heart of it will be the academic anchor, right? Where we hope to bring together world-class researchers, right? From a wide variety of disciplines who are thinking about this question of how we rebuild the foundations of democracy and doing work that is integrative across the sort of disciplines that people work in. But that's not going to be the only way that we're going to do work, right? We're also going to engage in the Agora Labs, right? Where in the labs, we are putting the research and questions in partnership with stakeholders and communities of practice around the world. So, so often, academic research can get siloed in its little, um, you know, in its, in its little towers, and academics are sitting at their computers, and every now and then they might write an op-ed that sort of gets those ideas out into the public. And I think part of the challenge that we want to engage is that, when we sort of think about our most complex problems about democracy, the challenges that we face are not just about information, about communicating the information out to people, but instead, it's about strategy, right? It's about asking people to work with us in partnership so that we can co-create solutions, right? And put those solutions into practice in the world. And that's what the Agora Labs hopes to do. And finally, through the Agora conversation, we hope to constantly be engaged in public dialogue. Right? One of the great things that we can do is make sure that we bring a sound kind of intellectual sort of evidence-based um, view into some of the most complicated and divisive conversations that we have all over the world around, um, the Agora, uh, around um, questions of democracy. And so, you know, I hope that through this work we're able to do work that um, pushes the boundaries of creativity to their limits, right? Knowing that we might take risks. Um, but that those risks are the kind of risks that we need to take to engage the world that we have right now, that we're able to sort of break down the silos that traditionally divide us, um, that we're able to sort of integrate research and practice, um, and bring data to bear on some of the most complicated and complex questions um, that we have before us. So I'm really delighted to have the opportunity today um, to really begin this work um, in partnership with many of you who are here today. And the panels that we have before us today um, are really just the beginning of the kind of conversations that we hope to be exploring and scrutinizing and probing through the work of the Agora Institute. So we have three great panels, um, and I am delighted to have the opportunity to invite the first panel um, to the stage today. So I'm not sure exactly um, where we're at, but I'd love to invite um, the first panel to come up to stage. And so while they come up, I will just introduce um, our speakers to you for just a moment. So we have joining us today um, three really distinguished people that I'm humbled to be able to uh, moderate a conversation with. 
Um, Rolf Meyer is the former Minister of Constitutional Affairs in South Africa. He's joined by Ibrahim Rasul, who's a former South African ambassador to the United States, and Tim Phillips, who's the founder of Beyond Conflict. And like many of the other panels that we've had today, um, we're going to start just by having a discussion between us. But then after that discussion, we're going to open up the conversation to Q&A with all of you. So I invite you to use the um, same app that you've been using throughout the conference to sort of send questions. And we really hope to have a really vibrant conversation about um, the work that these gentlemen have been doing um, that I think is really instructive about the kinds of things that we hope to be querying in the Institute. So without further ado, I'm going to try to step back a little bit to let you all kind of tell your stories. Um, and so to begin, Ibrahim, I'd like to invite you just to start by telling us, um, you know, the story that of the work that you've done, um, starting with your own experiences in South Africa and how that has launched this platform for the work that you're doing today. Well, thank you very much, um, Hari, and it's good to be with Tim and Ruth again, and especially in Athens. I want to really say that my first active memory of apartheid was when I was 10 years old, 1972, and I came home from school to find that all the furniture in our little house in District 6 was out on the pavement, my father desperately seeking a truck to get us on an alternative accommodation because the area we had loved, grown up in, where all our family and friends were, had been declared a white group area, an area designated only for white people and all black people like myself were now meant to vacate it. And if we did not vacate in time, the bulldozers would, ar would arrive and flatten the houses. That's when I knew that apartheid was more than just placing me with people who looked like me, talked like me, ate like me, dressed like me, and prayed like me. And that was my earliest memory. A few years later, I entered high school. It was the 1976 uprisings by students. I had my first taste of tear gas, of rubber bullets, and all of those kind of things. Four years later, I was the secretary of our student representative council, we organized a 12-week school boycott, boycotting by day and doing, catching up on the lessons by night without the help of teachers. And that really was a series of involvements, engagements, and commitments to the anti-apartheid struggle. I eventually became the secretary of the United Democratic Front, the internal ANC, leader of the ANC, but in between all of that, I had courtesy of Ruth Mayer, <laughs> who was the Deputy Minister of Police in the mid-1980s, responsible for administering the state of emergency. I spent two stints in jail, in detention without trial, and that's where I met, for example, Nelson Mandela in Polsmoor Prison. So I wouldn't change the jail at all because it gave me the greatest access to someone like Nelson Mandela even if it was only for a few minutes. And from that moment, my life was one of commitment, not just an accidental participant by virtue of the color of my skin in an anti-apartheid struggle. It was then that we participated in the transition from apartheid to democracy. It was then that um, I got involved in the very kind of halcyon days of establishing a new government but, ironically, I served in the same cabinet in the Western Cape government with the last apartheid police minister as my governor or premier, um, Ernest Krill. It was then that I began to start a friendship with people like Ruf Meyer, who led the negotiations from the National Party side. I had to unlearn so many of my stereotypes because it was comfortable thinking of the apartheid practitioners in terms that are caricatures of them, the stereotypes you set up of them, until you actually meet the people. You see their fears, you see their vulnerabilities, you see their aspirations, and you've got to recalibrate your own subliminal racism, your own assumptions 
of people and then to begin to encounter the human in the other and then to engage that. And that really has been my journey through, and I sit here today as the founder of the World for All Foundation that is trying very desperately in a very troubled world to teach people to see the humanity in each other while fighting injustice. And that really is the shortest summary that I can give of a really lovely life that I've l lived. Well, Rolf, maybe we could turn to you next, because I know that you've written very, uh, and spoken very powerfully about your own paradigm shift. And so I wonder if you could t describe a little bit of that to us. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I'm a few years older than Ebrai. So when he was talking about 1972, realizing what apartheid was doing to him and his family at the age of 10, I was a young lawyer at that stage. And it was more or less the time that I started to realize something was wrong. But prior to that, <coughs> uh, I didn't question apartheid. I lived in apartheid. I grew up in apartheid. My family was supporting apartheid. And it might have not been with a racial intent, but it was certainly benefiting the white minority in South Africa. So it was, it was a natural. When I was a student, and I look back now at what I was saying as a student leader of a white university, I'm ashamed for what I said. But that was the mode of the time. It was very easy to support apartheid as a young white at that stage in South Africa. So my road to, to transformation, personal change, started when, when I became aware as a young lawyer in the mid-1970s that something is wrong. When I looked at the law books and the specific discrimination that stood on the law books at the time against people like Ibrahim and particularly black African South Africans, I realized something is wrong. So I think the starting point was that question. What is wrong after becoming aware? And, you know, it took me quite a few years to actually completely transform my own mindset from where I was growing up as an apartheid supporter to becoming one who had the opportunity to contribute towards the change in South Africa. I can truly say by the time that Mandela was released in 1990, I was on the other side. I was completely convinced of where I have to be and what I needed to do. But it took me quite a few years, you can say 15 years, to make that transformation, to make that paradigm shift. And since you used the word, let me just describe what I mean. For, for three centuries or more, South Africa was divided according to its racial composition. Black majority or indigenous people of Africa and a white minority from Europe. And that led to a notion of superiority versus inferiority. That was the paradigm that defined the South African existence for more than 300 years. And it was that paradigm that we had to change. And fortunately, through the change that happened in the 1990s, through the process of dialogue and negotiations that we started, we managed to settle the South African case in a peaceful way. Amazingly so. Not a single person in this audience who lived during the 1980s, including ourselves, thought that it would be possible to make a peaceful change in South Africa. It seemed to be totally insurmountable. But and this is the beautiful part of the story of South Africa, is that we managed to do it on, in a peaceful way. Because common sense and wisdom and leadership of Mandela, the clerk, and many others helped us to sit down and iron out a peaceful settlement. And the core of it lies in this, to my mind, this, this ability that we discovered that we can change our paradigms from where we were, to what we had to achieve, like Abraham was also talking about. And that paradigm shift, the one of superiority versus inferiority, the minority ruling the majority, could be replaced with something that I think best can be described by saying we accepted the need for 
individual rights on an equal basis for all. And that is the foundation of our Constitution today. That was the turning moment. Once we replaced that old paradigm and, and brought in the new one of equality for all, protected by the Constitution, protected by the Constitutional Court, that was the answer. Thank you. Um, Tim, I want to bring your voice into the conversation here because I know that um, you've done so much work through Beyond Conflict to really um, you know, work on kind of resolving conflict in some of the toughest places around the world. So I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about the work and some of the lessons that you've drawn from all the uh, many places that you all have worked together everywhere. Well, uh, thank you. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here in Athens, and I want to thank Agora, John Hopkins, and the uh, Niarchos Foundation. It has been an impressive, incredible three days here in Athens, and I want to congratulate the people who have put their resources and their time into this because it is quite extraordinary and necessary at this time. You know, as I was listening to Ibrahim and Rolf, who I've known for a long time, I started taking notes. And the reason I was taking notes, because I'm thinking, how do I bring this home to the United States yet again? And the work of Beyond Conflict for 25, now 28 years, has been quite modest in the sense that what we've done is starting in Eastern Europe in 1991 and then working in nearly 75 countries, is bring together people like Rolf and Ibrahim and countless others to share their experience with people who can't imagine that change is possible. So starting at the end of the Cold War with the collapse of communism and the emergence of democracy and then the failure of states, whether it be Yugoslavia or the transition in South Africa, the Central American peace process, what happened in Northern Ireland, uh, and on and on, my recognition and that of colleagues of mine is that while there are a lot of people focusing, which is absolutely essential, on the creation of democratic institutions and market economies, you can create these structures, but do people feel like they belong to them? Can, if you come under, out of decades of dictatorship or living under conflict, can you actually step in and feel on that deeply sort of human visceral level that democracy means something for me? And if you've lived under repression for a long period of time, uh, democracy doesn't really exist, or if it doesn't, it's in name only. So the notion from the very beginning of Beyond Conflict is that we could sort of set the table and bring in leaders, often former enemies and others, who have struggled with change because they come from those countries. And they know there's much at stake, and a lot of history at stake, and a lot of loss in their histories, to help others imagine that they can achieve the same thing. And so that's been the core of our work around the world. But Rolf said to me about a decade ago, and other friends from different countries, you know, you've been working around the world as an American, but you need to start focusing in your own home. And I would say, well, I know we have some profound problems, but I was too close to it to not recognize what they recognize, almost as canaries in a coal mine, that something profoundly disturbing is happening in your country. And now what Beyond Conflict is doing is bringing the experience of Rolf and Ibrahim and many others to the United States. And also, which I'll talk about, I guess, later, about 10 years ago, started looking at brain and behavioral science. Mm -hmm. Because our approach is not based on, you know, forgive me for all the academics in the room, a theory that got me tenure. It was based on the power of shared experience. The notion that not only people can learn from each other, but the very nature of doing the power of shared experience is that you're building out a toolkit. You're building out experiences of people around the world to share with others. And then about 10 years ago, started looking at brain and behavioral science because it has so much profound knowledge about what it is to be human. And I have just to say that listening to Rolf and Ibrahim, one of the notes I took is superiority versus inferiority. And certainly in the United States, one could think about that in pretty bold terms. But what's really interesting in, in the divide in the United States, and we did some recent surveys, and others have as well, that the more educated Americans have become, the more contempt they have for those who don't. One of the big divides in America 
is the more educated you are, the less tolerant you are. And so there is an increasing notion of superiority by the very nature of education against those who don't have it. And if you look in the recent election, there's, in, there's growing contempt on each side for those who feel like we're tired of being looked down upon by those who feel they have something over us. And it's not just historic notions of power and structure, but knowledge and class and position. And so there are so many lessons uh, and one other quick thing is Rolf said that he looked back in shame and it seems to me I would rather have people in my country who need to change say in the future that I look back in shame with what I said as opposed to be so triggered in a position where they feel that what they did was right and just. And we need to create conditions when people can be like Rolf and others and say, you know what, I changed and I'm embarrassed with what I said in the past, rather than feeling they need to defend that past. So I want to pose a couple of questions that um, really are for anyone, um, not, um, I don't want to necessarily just have to direct it, but, so one of the things I think that's so interesting is, um, so you all speak about, um, you know, th this importance of being able to sort of um, rethink the way that we see each other and, and, and the experiences that you all had in doing that. But how does that sort of turn into the kind of, you know, societal change that you all experienced in South Africa? And, um, you know, I'm thinking, like, what's the role of leadership or how, do the, how does a sort of change in the way in which people kind of interact and behave with each other, you know, link to the sort of big structural and, and political changes that are really needed to, um, you know, to sort of make the kind of shifts that you all described? Well. I, I think we were extremely fortunate that we have a Nelson Mandela around. Right. Uh, maybe you can say that you won't find the Nelson Mandela in every, right. in every other country. But at the same time, I think we can learn a lot from what he did and how he did it. Right. And, and apply that in other parts of the world. Um, but let me emphasize three things that I think were key in our success, apart from the notion of leadership. Okay. and the role of leadership. Three things were critical, and I think those three are applicable wherever you go. I do a lot of work in many other conflict situations around the world, including Myanmar right now, and we can talk a lot about that in detail. But the three things that South Africa's story, I think, conveyed to other situations wherever it is, even including in the U.S., is the one of inclusivity. We followed a totally inclusive approach in terms of who sit around the table, who participate in the dialogue, and who participate in the negotiations. And it was Mandela who led us on that. He said, bring them all to the table. Even parties, small parties that had no proof of existence, really. People who were against him. He invited right-wingers from the white side. He invited them to come to the table. And so it was a very inclusive approach that we followed, not only in terms of parties, but also persuasions. And I think that's important. The second point is that we, that we succeeded in building trust across the divides. Uh, I was the team leader of the negotiations on the former white government side. Cyril Ramaphosa, who is now our president of South Africa, was the team leader of the ANC on the other side. We worked together for six years, eye to eye, without interruption. And through that we built a level of trust that never will go away. There was a chemistry between us that said one thing, and that is there's a, no problem that we can't resolve. That was very powerful in terms of the outcome of what we achieved. We did not necessarily always agree. Of course. We started off as enemies at the beginning, but we succeeded through this process in building trust to the level where nothing could stop us from realizing a peaceful transition. And the third thing was the fact that we did it ourselves. We had no mediators or facilitators or outsiders. Yes, we took advice. We took advice from people like Tim and others from all over the world. We had engagements with 
the Secretary General of the UN on various occasions, who was Butros Butros Ghali at the time. And, and so we engaged, but when it came back to the point of making peace, it was us taking that responsibility directly, own ownership. It happened, when, and let me just tell this anecdote, right in the middle of the process, while the negotiations was going on for more than two years, there was a total breakdown. Mandela called off the negotiations because of what happened during a massacre south of Johannesburg, close to Johannesburg. And he said he can't talk to us any longer. His words were, I, there's no credibility left in this white government. I can't talk to them. So he called the negotiations off. The next moment, my phone was ringing. It was Cyril Ramaphosa from the ANC side saying, when can we talk? There was nobody otherwise in between. It was just the two of us. And for the next three months, we sat down and we talked uninterruptedly to find the answers. And I think that is key. You have to build that trust. You have to take that ownership and come up with the answers because it's in the interest of everybody. Just to, to add to what Ruth is saying, mm -hmm. that while a Mandela and a de Klerk emerged at particular moments, good leaders must fall on fertile soil. If you have not disabled the gene of populism in the population, a popular, credible, wise leader will not find fertile soil. So in the ANC, we grew up with the slogan that says, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. We questioned why the white part, because they were the enemy. And then it clicked with us that unlike in Mozambique, Angola, in Congo, etc., where the colonialists had a homeland to go back to, our colonialists, the white community of South Africa, had nowhere else to go. They were there forever. And we had better come to terms with that reality. And that's why we called our struggle colonialism of a special type because our colonialists, their home was South Africa. And the problem today is that we all believe that the other can go away. The other is ejectable. Mm -hmm. The other does not belong. And the moment you make that shift, immigration policy becomes integration policy. Mm -hmm. And that is the fundamental paradigm shift that I think was the core. The second thing is everyone can have an opinion and we can have inclusivity of all parties in a negotiating process. But we develop a concept called sufficient consensus. When the middle ground has spoken, it is consensus. We don't need all in consensus because the result of that is that any Tom, Dick and Harry and sometimes a Mary can have a veto over your process. That is what is disabling the Palestinian-Israeli settlement. Everyone has a veto button. Yeah. If you don't like what is happening, you love a rocket. If you don't like what is happening, you announce a settlement. And then all processes and engagement and dialogue ends. In South Africa, we refused to give the veto button to the extremes. They were accommodated, but they were not decisive. And so these are practical rules of engagement that I think learned, and it needed the kind of moral authority of a Nelson Mandela and a powerful pragmatism of a F.W. de Klerk in order to make it work, but they were dealing with a very prepared ground. The ANC, through the discipline of not hating whites, not hating the system but not the people, believing that the people were redeemable, and on the National Party side, the ANC taking responsibility for the constituency of the National Party by engaging its intellectual sport and other leaders to prepare them for a process that they could go and prepare society for so that when the leaders were ready, we were all engaged in that process.
Kiona. The, um, what's really interesting in the experience of South Africa is a country that structurally was about us versus them. And there are many thems and one us for a long time in South Africa. What I see happening in the United States and other countries in, in Europe is we're going from this notion of you and I to us versus them. So we're, we're moving in the wrong direction. And you know, one of the things that we're seeing in the work we're doing in the United States, and one of the things when what we're finding is working with brain and behavioral scientists uh, at different universities uh, and within our own organization, is that not only are Americans aggregating a lot of historic fault lines and democratic and republican identities, mm -hmm. that we're going from an uh, you and I mindset to an us versus them mindset, and it's deepening. And one thing we know from, again, science, is that when you go to an us versus them mindset, a whole set of unconscious psycholo psychological processes really start to come online and get accelerated. And we're in a hyper-polarized environment in the United States. So that adds to what is a toxic mix of polarization, which like conflict is inherent in democracy and in every relationship. But when it becomes toxic, it's like a disease that may have been you know, initiated from an external trigger, but it gets to a point where that then takes over your body. And we're at a state in the United States where this sort of toxic polarization, this us versus them, it's really becoming sectarian in the United States to the point that not only do we really need to, and like in a public health way, unpack this, find out what are the realities of where we're really divided, but how do we begin to learn from South Africa and others, not these historic, this is how you negotiate, but what Ibrahim was saying, how do you encounter the human in another? Because one thing that science is sort of reaffirming, and which is why we got very excited about it, is they said the Enlightenment got a lot of this wrong. We are not these reason-based rational beings where emotions get in the way. In fact, it's sort of the opposite, that we're deeply sort of emotionally based and consciously based beings that to a large extent can only fully think rationally when we feel that our identities are understood and valued by others. Our brains evolved to be predictive and not reactive. So there's a lot to be disparaging about, particularly in the United States, where I'm focusing most of our effort. But at the same time, we're learning something profound about what it is to be human, that the more we engage with it, the more we take these researchers and scientists out of the lab and bring them to the real world and connect the real world to what they're learning, I think we can make paradigm shifting changes. And I think we need to start also with a younger generation. And we're entering into an election season in the United States where this hyper polarizing language, and there are a lot of structural components, right? And issues of racism, which is profound and deeply uh, unfortunate and sad United States, and, and so many competing pressure points are coming together. We need to step back and say, you know, American exceptionalism existed, I think, more in people's minds than reality. And what's exceptional is that other people who came from an us versus them mindset and try to transition where there's a you and I can really help us try to figure this out. But we have to do it in the most human terms possible. So um, as we think about that challenge, you know, Rolf, I'm reminded of a conversation that we had yesterday where um, you, know, you raised the question about, is the work that you all did in South Africa, would it have been possible now in the moment that we're in around the world, um, given, you know, given just the, a lot of the, the, the trends that we see? And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that and, and you know, where you know, what you see is possible now or not. You see, I think you, we make a few mistakes when we deify Nelson Mandela, because mm -hmm. then every society that is troubled waits for that messianic moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, already ob ubiquitous 
social media situation where people like but don't organize, where people retweet but don't mobilize, where people forward but don't debate. Um, I think that kind of nostalgia for leaders is a, is a very disabling factor because we give our power away. Whereas we need to be able to claim that power and to harness it, especially given the fact that populism is an equal opportunity felon. Um, and that extremism that we encountered 10 years ago, which were largely dressed in Muslim clothes, speaking Arabic and praying in particular ways, that that extremism today, 10 years later, have been matched by a mainstreamed extremism that now sits in the White House, that now is able to govern Hungary, that is the, a big party in France, etc., etc. So this particular challenge um, is a very crucial one, and we need to ask what lessons can we, can we learn out of it. I think the one thing is that where there is wrong and where there is injustice, it has to be opposed. And I think that we all try to be very prudent in the way in which we theorize how to oppose injustice. In South Africa, it was a matter of survival, that we needed to oppose it. And, 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 I, and I think that that urgency isn't there because we have single issue politics. We all in our corners, very busy, we see climate change as the cause celebre, without its connection to poverty. Some fight poverty and failures of the education system without its thing with race. We try to be victims of bigotries. Who is, are the biggest victims? Are, are the Muslims the biggest victim? Are the gays the biggest victim? Are the blacks the biggest victim? Are the Hispanics the biggest? So we have a competition of victimhoods rather than a coalition of victimhoods. There's nothing that pulls us together, whereas in the anti-apartheid struggle, we learned a very important lesson. Keep your message simple. We wanted a united, non-racial, democratic, non-sexist, um, unitary South Africa. Only five things mattered, and all the others were matters of detail that would take its place when we resolve the fundamental problems in the United States. I don't think that they see the threat, the existential threat that the United States poses to the world today. Why should we be on the brink of war constantly? Why should we be on brinkmanship constantly? And so I think it's because we're all active, but in our own corners, without an overarching vision of who we are. We are not asking the fundamental existential question, who are we, what are our values, and are they worth fighting for? And if they are worth fighting for, how do we fight? We, and, 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 and so those are absolutely crucial, um, crucial matters. And, 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 and I think that there's just very little urgency in the world. We've abdicated to electoral politics only. It's important to vote. We must vote. I always tell Muslim audiences, if 10,000 Muslims were not sitting on their bums in 2016 and gone to vote, the electoral college may have swung. So it's important, but it is not sufficient. And therefore, coalition politics has to be the politics of the future um, as, we, as we go forward. And that is what made us successful. We may have all our debates now, but we have one the fundamental problem in which we can actually have debates. I, uh, <clears throat> I think two points come to my mind in relation to your question. Um, the one is the, the role of civil society in South Africa. We, we talk as if it was only the politicians <laughs> that made the peace in our situation. Yeah. It's not true. I mean, fundamentally what, what Abraham and his comrades did during the 1980s was to mobilize civil society because no legal opposition to apartheid was allowed at the political level. The ANC was a banned organization. But they could operate as civil society and mobilize themselves. And it was under the guidance and the leadership of the great man, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who is often forgotten now, but his role in the 1980s was magnificent in the South African struggle, to bring about change, always pleading for change. And, and, and that, I think, is a great example that, that one should consider elsewhere in the world too. Uh, 
and, and, and more recently we've seen the same. You know, we had terrible 10 years under Jacob Zuma in South Africa recently. I'm sure many of you are aware of that. <laughs> it was a destructive period. Despite our gains about democracy in South Africa, this was a period of destruction between 29, 2009 and 2017. And, and he was brought down, not by the ANC, not by his comrades in the ANC, but by civil society and the actions of civil society. Of course, we have the instruments and the institutions that, that could be leveraged in the process, like the Constitutional Court, the Public Protector Office, etc., etc. Uh, but it was civil society who took him to action every time. And in the end, he lost the battle at the political level. So I think the, the message is, you know, if civil society in its different formats, whether it's academia, uh, the religious communities, etc., etc., can mobilize in all those plethora of activities, it can bring about the required change. And I have often said to Tim in recent times, where is the, the, the voices calling from the grassroots level, mm -hmm. so to speak? We've seen it in our case. It's probably a completely different environment, but you know, those are the things that I think can be done. Last point in this regard I would like to make is, you know, if we talk about change, it starts with yourself. And going back to what I said earlier, if I look back at my own personal paradigm shift that, that happened with me, that I can speak from, from deep emotional experience about, it materialized because not because I could see intellectually only the need for change. I also had to buy into it with my soul. I accepted it from the point of view of what my, my brain might have told me, the need for, which I think is best described as pragmatic change. But it also came about as a result of the way in which I consumed it within my own soul. So I could live the change and not only preach it, not only talk about it, but practice it from deep within. And I think that's the difference in a certain way between pragmatism and a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. So if you want real change, it means heart and brain <laughs> corresponding and working together to achieve that result. So, thank you. Um, I want to go, we have a lot of questions here, and so I want to go um, to the questions in just a second. So if um, you have any other questions, please do continue to send them in. Um, but before we turn to that, I just want to ask, um, why do you think it's harder now for us to see that kind of coalitional politics that's grounded in ourselves, but also, in, you know, kind of creates this co capacity for us to sort of work with each other? Why is that harder now, you know, than it was in the, in the times that you were working in. And, and I know that you all, we've spoken a lot about South Africa, but I know that you know, all of you have really done work in some of the most intractable places all over the world. And so I'd invite you to speak to any of those experiences um, and, and reflect on sort of the moment that we're in. Well, um, so when the day, if you remember, of Toronto, uh, Donald Trump's election, uh, inauguration, there was this women's march yep. all over the world, and I live in Boston, and there were about 300,000 people that came out. And it was extraordinary. But I didn't see a lot of people of color there. And I asked a friend of mine, um, who's a, an African-American community leader, why didn't I see more people of color? And he said, I was surprised as well, but a lot of people felt, well, where were these white women when we've been marching for years. And I got very sad. And it's like, you know what? My mother used to say, I don't care if you're late to the party, show up. And whatever drove you to the party, whatever brought you to the party, if you then stay in the party, then change can happen. Or in that case, a good time could happen. So I think the coalitional politics um, there hasn't been, and I think this moment is emerging broadly in the United States, where there is, to Ibrahim's point, an existential threat. 
um, apartheid represented an existential threat. Uh, a dictatorship represents an existential threat. If you're living under a conflict like Northern Ireland, that's an existential threat. If you're living under war in Colombia with everything going on. But the United States, there were many existential threats, but not one overarching one. And I think I, I've noticed that when I came back, I was in London doing some work with Mayor Khan. Uh, uh, I was with Rolf, actually, in, in London as well. And I saw friends of mine who were mostly immigrants to the United States, but had lived there for a while, and they felt a deep sense of sadness and outrage. And what I realized is they felt a sense of betrayal in the election of Donald Trump. And the betrayal was, how could the American people vote for a man like this with everything they knew? And it struck me that for a lot of African Americans or immigrants from the Muslim world, I think they felt and, see, and saw our betrayal on a daily basis. Did they really feel like the system and everybody around it was there for them? So when all of a sudden you have a broad swath, and not just people who oppose Trump, but even people who support Trump, increasing sense of betrayal from the system, then this notion of an existential threat is starting to emerge. And the question is, how do we then organize a movement of different interest with a shared recognition of what is the social contract of this nation going forward? And I don't know if it takes a Mandela-like or many Mandelas to help articulate that, but we need that in the United States. And that's why I keep on going back to the human dimension of this. I mean, the very notion of shared experience and beyond conflict is shared human experience. And what's great about the work we're doing in brain and behavioral science, what we all have in common is we each have a three pound brain. Mine is about a pound and a half. But most people have about three pound brain. It is the most complex organism in the known universe. We know the least about it, but everything we think and feel occurs in this organ. And so we're looking at that because one of the things that both Rolf and Ibrahim talked about with Nelson Mandela and many others, think about it, we're about issues that we hold to be sacred. And here's what's interesting about sacred values. They're processed differently in the brain than every other calculation we make. Because they're so tied to what's important to us and the community that's really important to us. And yet we violate each other's sacred values on a daily basis without recognizing it. And so the, the need to begin to unpack this scientifically, the need to connect it with real world experience is one of the things we're doing, trying to create new frameworks for dialogue, but also recognizing that we need to be having these conversations in that church you mentioned in Ohio mm -hmm. with others for people who are struggling with change, to step outside of themselves. And it is absolutely essential. I have so many questions I want to ask, but I feel that I should give the audience a, a, a moment. And so um, there's one that, um, actually, I, 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 I'm not going to read the whole question, but um, I just want to read the beginning of it. And it, it starts by saying, Minister Meyer seems overly modest about what it took to move the recognition of equal rights and democratic elections in his country. Um, and the question goes on to ask um, about how it is that you move people to a place where, um, of, of reaching the kind of, um, you know, compromise, if that's the right word, um, you know, when some people have to have something taken away from them. You know, so it's, it's that people have to be willing to sort of give something up. And I'm wondering if you all can reflect on that a little bit. Well, in, in some quarters in white South Africa, I'm still a traitor, even right. today. I experience that from time to time, very directly. Uh, but, but the point is, I think we succeeded in bringing along the majority. And, and prior to that, we have to realize, we have to accept the fact there were a number of outside factors that played hugely into, let's say, our favor of realizing a peaceful transition. The whole world was against apartheid South Africa. There was not a single country in the world that supported apartheid at the time that we started the process of change. So, in a certain way, our backs were against the wall. 
the ANC on the other side was a very effective mobilizing force, both internally as well as outside. Internally through the activities of civil society, Ebrahim and the UDF were real troublemakers. They wanted to make the country ungovernable and they succeeded. <laughs> and, and so we had to address that. So that was another factor that played into bringing about the change. But I think the, the most important one, from my perspective at least, is that we internally realize something is wrong. Something is unjust, indefensible, and we have to change. We were not quite sure. When Mandela stepped out of prison in February of 1990, we had no clear direction of where we were going, quite frankly. There was no grand plan yet because we had to sit down and negotiate. And that, I think, was a fundamental factor in the, all of this. There were no conditions. Mandela didn't walk out of prison on a conditional basis. He, from his side, didn't say he would walk out if the following conditions are being met. So it was completely a, a plain open playing field, a new agenda. It was like the demise of the old and the creation of the new, which was fantastic. In very few situations of transition, that's possible. So we could, we could generate and create new ideas. We could meet with each other, sometimes friendly and sometimes not so friendly. But through a process of six years, we came out with the right result. So, so the the need for change was a very common factor at the time that, that we started. And that was realized by the vast majority of South Africans. We had the fringes on both sides, on the left and on the right, but they were fringes. And the center was strong enough and, and actually empowered us, mm -hmm. like Ibrahim was saying earlier, empowered us to do the right thing and with the support of the international community. So, so maybe lastly, of course, it was also the end of the Cold War. <laughs> right. you know, so it was, a, it was in general a situation where everybody was looking for some positive news. And this was coming out of South, South Africa suddenly, unexpectedly so. But, but you see, the project in South Africa was too important to leave to the National Party. And what people like Nelson Mandela did was, in a sense, to use the dictum, strengthen your enemy. So many negotiations and engagements are about destroying your enemy. But if you are going to become Siamese twins, you've got to ensure the strength of your enemy to carry their community with them and not to be trapped by the community and so much politics in the United States and all over are about leaders and parties who are trapped by their constituencies but no one being able to find a direct line to those constituencies and in that regard we met with the intellectual intelligentsia of the Africana nation to show them who we are Secondly, Nelson Mandela understood that the task of liberation was not governing a country, but was restoring the humanity from the dehumanization that apartheid did to blacks, from the dehumanization that whites did to themselves in the act of brutality against blacks. Now, if you don't recognize that vulnerability in whites as well, you don't know what to start healing and what to start appealing for. And out of that, to understand the vulnerabilities and fears of the white community and to give them limited guarantees to say, we will not dismantle everything that you have as holy. We will even respect your... And that's why the movie Invictus is so powerful. It wasn't about Nelson Mandela loving rugby. He may have known nothing about rugby, but he understood the importance of rugby to the Afrikaners. And the true liberation came the day when he embraced the Afrikaner symbol of virility, the Springbok rugby captain's jersey, and celebrated joyously 
the victory of South Africa over the All Blacks, New Zealand. And so those are the kind of investments that need to be made in order to be able to move a country out of the conflict into the possibility of a future. Tim, did you want to jump in? I, I just going to quickly say that um, leadership, I mean, one thing we know is how norms are set and have a, a huge, I mean, more people discuss norms in the United States outside of an academic classroom than I think has ever been hap happened in my lifetime, how they're being violated and how important they are. But norms are set to a large extent by leadership, you know, not just political, it's cultural, it's uh, media and many other places. And I remember um, a colleague of, of Ibrahim's who was the chief speechwriter for Nelson Mandela when he was coming out of prison, got the draft of the speech that Mandela was going to give to the world upon his release. And there were these comments. And one was from Mandela that said, F.W. de Klerk is an honorable man. And the speechwriter said, Madiba, you can't say that. I mean, you're just coming 27 years out of prison. Your people are waiting. And Mandela said, no, it's up to him to deserve it. And think of that. What he was doing was recognizing that he had, as Nelson Mandela, a moral, political authority, and he needed to share it. It goes to Ibrahim and Rolf's point that you need partners in this work. And sometimes your partner doesn't recognize that they're partners yet, right? So you give some of your equity, you give some of that capital to the other side. And it's full of criticism. Mandela, you know, was criticized in many ways. And then the other thing about dehumanization, what you were saying, Ibrahim, of what it does to those who do the act of dehumanization or the community does, it does take a toll on them. And one of the things I've seen with people who have survived torture from around the world, what they tell me is what begins to restore for them as an individual a sense of human dignity is when they recognize that the ones who did this to them suffered as well. Not suffered in prison, but suffered emotionally for the recognition of what they did to you. And there's something deeply almost primal, biological to know that when another person who tortured you suffers, that in that act of saying, I suffered, is they're recognizing that what I did to you was wrong because you didn't deserve it. And I think, and I've seen that, and that is so powerful. Tim, I'm reminded of a story that you told me yesterday about um, your friend who said, who is this guy, Norm? <laughs> Poor Norm is getting violated everywhere <laughs> these days. Um, so I actually want to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you. So all of you have spoken about the importance of this urgency, right? And, and that, in, you know, that there was sort of the wind at your sails um, in, in the work that you did and, um, you know, in, um, in South Africa in particular. And on the one hand, I see your point about like that ur people, that urgency not being there right now. But on the other hand, I feel like I see lots of people that actually do have a deep sense of urgency and, and uncertainty about the moment that we're in. I think a lot of people are here today feeling uncertainty about where democracy is going um, all over the world. Um, you know, Tim, you spoke about um, constituencies that have been historically marginalized for many, many years, not, you know, Trump being just the mere kind of capstone to sort of a long legacy uh, of that kind of urgency. And so, you know, the flip side of urgency is hope, right? And so I guess either from the research or from your own experience, like I wonder if you could speak a little bit about where, um, or not the flip side, but the sort of juxtaposition of urgency is you need hope, right? So that people sort of turn that into acts so that where, when people's sacred values are being threatened or when people do feel fear, like how does that become a catalyst for action as opposed to a retreat into just fear or, um, or inaction? Well, uh, we certainly violate each other's sacred values, either knowingly or unknowingly. But it seems to me that one of the first things we should do is allow people to state what is sacred to them before we talk about our shared values and what are common values. Because in a divided community or family or any setting, when we try to go to, and this often happens in work and dialogue, Let's talk about the values we have in common. That's very difficult to do when people really at a, an explicit or an unconscious level are really contesting and don't trust. 
But my thought is, if you start with, tell me what is sacred to you, it doesn't mean you have to share in what is sacred to that person, but to recognize it, I think has a deep emotional resonance for people because then what it also does is it begins to shift that maybe they're not going to be under threat for something that is so absolutely central to their identity, particularly their identity as it relates to their group. I, I, I think there are two things that need to be addressed, you know, in, in relation to, to the whole question of conflict, and that is on the one side fear, on the other side greed. Um, if, if we look at what is playing out in, in the Middle East, um, you know, there's a lot of greed about behind that. If I look at what is playing out in many countries in Africa where I am working, like the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, and a, a number of others, it's about greed. Greed of those that are in leadership and don't want to share it, or are afraid of losing it if they have to submit to democratic practices. And, and, and I think in the next panel, there will be obviously a discussion on the consequences mm -hmm. of all of this. Uh, I see it in the case of Myanmar uh, on an ongoing basis where it's, it's this consequence of of what we can d define as greed and, and fear. And, and how to address that is obviously not that easy. But there are ways. Uh, and, and what we're trying to do, for instance, as a matter of example, in Myanmar, is in Rakhine State, where the Rohingya group is coming from, the refugees that find themselves now in Bangladesh, in that state, to try and get people on the ground to start collaborating with each other, to address those fears and the greed, because it's, it's that interplay. And, and we have established now a project that is called Intercommunal Dialogue at the heart of the area where the Rohingya is coming from. And, and so far we are seeing progress. I won't say success, but we are seeing progress. The moment that people are, are introduced, so to speak, to each other. Rakhine Buddhists and Muslim Rohingya. When they start to interact and seek the common aspirations, the common goals and objectives that they want to, to realize. On Monday this week, the first joint committee, which is a pilot project, had started to meet there in Mangdao Township in the north of Rakhine State. And it's composed of people from all those communities, including the minority communities. And the one objective that they have together is to find a way to work towards peace in those communities. So what I'm saying is if we can address fear and, and greed <laughs> in that way, I think we can see the same result that we've seen in South Africa, because similar intercommunal peace committees at the grassroots level helped us hugely in the early 1990s in South Africa, when there was a complete breakout of new political violence in the country. And, and that was the only way through which we con could contain it. In other words, through getting people to start working together, rebels, activists, together with the establishment. You know, Harry, what I think we're doing is to put together a complex picture mm -hmm. of what are the possibilities for reconciliation. But I wouldn't want the audience to go away thinking that reconciliation is a kind of namby-pamby thing that is all just mother's milk and honey and stuff like that. It's hard. We have understood in South Africa that reconciliation is the intersection between the need for justice and the desire for peace. That if the pursuit of justice is too absolute, you are never at peace. 
And sometimes if the prevalence of peace or non-conflict is so absolute, you've probably compromised on justice. But reconciliation gives you sufficient peace and sufficient justice in order to pursue them per perfectly. To create enough dialogue space, to create enough engagement space, to create enough freedom of struggle and all of those kind of things in order to pursue both of them. But that's the hard thing and that was what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was about. It was about people having to confess the atrocities that they were involved in in order to gain the trust and the amnesty of the nation. If there were inconsistencies in your story, you did not get amnesty. And that really was what it was about. We just needed sufficient healing as we go forward. The United States, for example, doesn't have even the flimsiest basis to have an honest conversation today because they've swept under the carpet a genocide, an enslavement period, a segregation, a women's suppression mode, and a whole lot of different things. If you can't even convene to say, let us confess our vulnerability as a nation, you are constantly creating a mirage of a dream, a mythology, rather than a reality. And that, I think, is the veracity of the South African story that I think we tell you today. So we are coming up... Um We're coming up on, on the end of our time, and so, um, but I want to close with sort of one final question. You know, as I, um, as I look through the questions that are on the list, it's, it's um, a lot of people I think are, um, in some ways are kind of asking the question of what do we do now? You know, there's a, different versions of this, and people are pointing to the refugee crisis, they're pointing to sort of co different kind of conflicts that we have all over the world, and, and I think are looking to you all and, and your experience and, you know, asking this question of what do we do now? And, and so I want to sort of pose that question in kind of an open-ended way to wrap us up today. And, and, you know, kind of, you know, I would sort of, you know, say it a little bit more um, specifically, which is sort of, you know, building off of what you said earlier, it's like, how do we, what, what, if we're the gardeners, or if we want to be gardeners, right, how do we create the fertile soil that enables people to sort of reclaim their power? You know, what are the choices that we can make now um, to fertilize that soil, to lay the foundation, to make possible the kind of things that you describe all over the world? The first thing is, don't let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> we didn't do that in South Africa. I think the idea really is, how do we utilize the energy of young people who know that what is happening in their country and the world, that it's not right? And how do we give it content? How do we organize it? Don't be seduced by the false activism of social media. It's a tool, an important tool, but it is not activism. How do we create the foundations for activism as we go forward? Thirdly, just because the enemy no longer wears a wep uh, bears a weapon, wears a uniform, incarcerates you, doesn't mean that there is not an adversary out there worthy of being taken on. Don't be fooled by the idea that because Obama was in the White House, we are in a post-racial America. Don't be fooled by the fact that poverty is a kind of organic thing that happens to people. And I think that those, and how do we create the, an overarching coalition of social movements to make it a powerful cross-cultural, cross-sectional, cross-sectoral um, movement? Don't be happy in your corner but create the antennas and the connections with other people's corners as well. That is how Islamophobia will be fought, xenophobia will be fought, misogyny will be fought, um, it's, racism will be fought, anti-Semitism will be fought. It is when people recognize the commonness of all their individual struggles. Okay. <laughs> Just uh, very briefly, Hari, I think... Uh, I think if we can find a way to define the future, the, 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 the 
real future that we want, it will help us to work towards that. You know, just going back to our experience, the turning moment for us during the negotiations in work and starting to work together, really with a common goal, was when the breakdown happened and we had to go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves, what is the future that we want? How should it look like? What is the vision that we have for a future mutual constitution and a constitutional framework that serves all South Africans? And, and once we change that mindset towards the future, instead of looking at what we want to protect from the past, it was all the way towards a common goal and how to resolve the problem. So I think it's, it's a question of where the world finds itself today. Uh, if I look at Europe, <laughs> there are not many good examples of what we would like to see Europe as coming forward with leadership. The same applies to the United States. And I think it's, it's something that we all can work together in, in, in defining that, that preferred outcome, the vision that we are expecting this world to achieve, instead of looking at what we want to protect from the past. And, and organizations like this can play a major role. I'm so impressed, like Tom was saying at the beginning, I'm so impressed with what we've heard during the last few days. And I can just encourage organizations like this to carry on and do what is right. So the task is up to you. <laughs> um, Harry, to your question about urgency, absolutely. There is an increasing well of urgency from even those, again, reflecting on the United States, who are complacent and now feel a sense of urgency. And a lot of these newly, uh, ur not resurgent, but urgent <laughs> um, communities don't have a history of activism. They were a sort of privileged members of a community. They're the ones who are feeling something profoundly is wrong. They don't have that muscle memory of activism. And yet, you know, there, there needs, so urgency is there. But we can't, and this is particularly why I find the South African model of how the, their transition period in particular is so powerful, is we have to center it on what these structures, what these systems, what history does to people, what they do to individuals. And in the fear, ang anger, anxiety, um, and the structural definitions that people use to both identify what they don't like, and then organize against it, we end up deepening the us versus them challenge. And so there is urgency. We do have to work across, but in a way that builds those constituencies, finds that connective tissue, those common threads. Um, and the world is also rapidly changing, not just in the US, not just in Europe, it is changing. And, you know, uh, Ibrahim often quotes Gramsci about the collapse of the old and the emergence of the new. It's that in-between period we're in now. And that in-between period is where there's the most chaos and fear and anxiety. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you all for um, your patience with, um, with everything and all the great questions. I'm sorry that I couldn't get to everything, but I hope that we can continue the conversations. Um, we're moving into a break now, and so we hope that we can continue the, these many conversations with each other. And we'll reconvene back here at 1145. So thank you. Welcome back. Um, for those of you, if you're just joining us online or in the room, uh, we're excited to continue our discussions today reflecting on how we can learn how to talk across divides. So I'm really pleased now to welcome our next participants to talk about building coalitions 
And they'll be looking at this issue through both the lens of history and, as previously, uh, experience. So please welcome Martha Jones, the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of American History at Johns Hopkins University, and Mark Morial, Pre President and CEO of the National Urban League and former mayor of New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, as before, Martha and Mark will be taking questions from the audience at the end of the conversation, so please send in your questions um, to the URL that will be on the screen, and for those of you online, please do the same. And also feel free to tweet throughout at hashtag SNF Dialogues. Thank you. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Um, and good afternoon. Uh, we are just a few minutes here um, from noon in Athens, and um, I want to join, I think, the chorus of thank yous um, to um, the foundation, uh, to Johns Hopkins, um, and particularly to you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for being here Thank you, with Professor. us. Really thrilled um, to have you. Great to be here. Good. I'm, I'm in, uh, let me, yeah, first of all, just thank you. I want to thank Johns Hopkins and uh, everyone here for having me and for, uh, for the chance to be part of a powerful dialogue. So it's just about that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, we get to talk. Yeah, we get a chance um, for to... about 30 minutes. Yeah, um, and uh, it has been a pleasure to be here with you because you. Um, folks won't be surprised that we've had some downtime together to get to know one another. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I began this conversation um, with something as uh, straightforward as your bio, mm -hmm. um, and folks can read more about you online and and in their programs. Um, but what struck me is um, the way in which you have been um, a leader mm -hmm. through difficult dialogues, mm -hmm. but a, a leader of extraordinary range, mm -hmm. right? A legislator, um, mm -hmm. a chief executive, um, a convener, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, and one of the things I hope we can talk about is what it means to be a big tent Person because mm -hmm. I think that is, for me, the thread that runs mm -hmm. through your work. Mm -hmm. So to get us there, um, I want to talk about um, what it means for us to be connected to one another. Mm -hmm. And I want to introduce, if you'll allow me, mm -hmm. um, a third uh, interlocutor into this conversation, mm -hmm. someone from my own work, mm -hmm. um, from the 19th century mm -hmm. um, American past, uh, political philosopher, poet, novelist, uh, Baltimorean mm -hmm. of the 19th century, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Mm -hmm. And I want to introduce her because she really makes her mark on um, these questions about difficult dialogues mm -hmm. in the years immediately following the Civil War. Mm -hmm. She is part of an old coalition of abolitionists and women's rights advocates who have now managed to mm -hmm. see their first objective, the abolition mm -hmm. of slavery, accomplished. Mm -hmm. But they live in the midst of a nation that has been wrenched. Mm -hmm. and nearly wrecked by civil war. Talk mm -hmm. about difficult mm -hmm. dialogues. Mm -hmm. And Watkins Harper in this coalition is part of a debate mm -hmm. about where the nation goes as it moves forward. Mm -hmm. Where do black Americans fit? Mm -hmm. Where do women fit? And for me, one of her great lines is this, we are all bound up in one great bundle mm -hmm. of humanity. Mm -hmm. And I thought that might be a place to start, mm -hmm. is sort of that idea that somehow when we come to rooms big and small, um, we begin with this deep assumption that we are all bound up together. And, uh, you know, I think you, you make a good point. The last panel and I don't want a point the last panel made to be lost when they talked about this idea of finding common ground. Look, I think coalition building emerges in a crisis. It emerges out of necessity. It emerges because 
there is an absence of absolute power or absolute power is rejected. Coalition building is uh, an invention of necessity in many instances. Uh, while we may think of it as a, a lofty goal and uh, as something we should try to uh, achieve, it is always born of conflict. So if you look at the Reconstruction period, the Reconstruction period was a time post a tremendous period of conflict when people were trying to put uh, the country, if you will, back together. If you look at the post-civil rights era, uh, you see much of the same thing. If you look at contemporary American politics, which is playing out uh, on the national stage in the United States, uh, where it becomes very apparent that to achieve electoral successes, one must effectuate coalitions because no group, no subgroup, no, uh, if you will, has sufficient power to get to a majority. Uh, you see this kind of coalition building as being much more present uh, in European parliamentary systems where parties have to coalesce. In the United States, it's not necessarily uh, indeed the case. So, you know, coalition building, for me, uh, you know, we shared, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we had a connection, uh, an, a very interesting personal connection, uh, back to the neighborhood where I uh, grew up in New Orleans. And, uh, and, and to a great extent, and I'll share this, my view of uh, the world and, 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 and my leadership was shaped uh, by that neighborhood and shaped by the experiences of that neighborhood. So that neighborhood called Punchatrain Park was an all-black neighborhood in New Orleans. It was built in the 1950s. The intent uh, when the city fathers built the neighborhood, the intent was to maintain racial segregation. So they created a neighborhood where African Americans for the first time could own homes. But interestingly, it was next to a white neighborhood of virtually the same size and the same economic character. These were middle, lower to middle to middle class neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, very early on, the first year I went to school, the schools were integrated, but the school was in the white neighborhood. So we had to traverse from the black neighborhood into the white neighborhood to go to an integrated school. When I got to middle school, uh, I left the neighborhood to go to an all-white uh, middle school, first African-American student to attend that school. So many, in many instances, when I was growing up, I had to live a dual existence. I had to live in the all-black neighborhood, and I had to go to the all-white school. I had a set of friends at school. I had a set of friends in the neighborhood. The friends in the neighborhood didn't know the friends at school. The friends in the school didn't know the friends in the neighborhood, and so be it, and had to navigate. And you learn interesting things about people uh, when you grow up in that kind of existence. You learn about differences and you learn about similarities. You learn about hopes, fears, aspirations, stereotypes, and the like. So it shaped a lot of uh, how I've thought about uh, trying to lead uh, in all instances where I had an opportunity to, to lead. You really anticipate um, Francis mm -hmm. Ellen Watkins Harper, mm -hmm. um, who at the one hand wants to tell us we are all sort of part of one humanity, um, but she also wants to talk about what it means to come out of a slave society, what it means to come out of a city like Baltimore, what it means to be a black woman in mm -hmm. this historical moment. And I think sometimes we find it difficult to speak those two narratives at the same time. In other words, how do we bring our particularity, our starting point? So. It is true, I told you two things about me when we met. Um, one is that I was born in central Harlem. That's mm -hmm. an important piece for me to put on yes. the table. Um, and two, um, it turns out that um, my father's most beloved cousin, um, Bill Jones, lived just around the corner from you. Right. Um, and these are very particular um, moments, places, um, and so how do you navigate that? In other words, we're trying to be part of one conversation, but there is a way in which we begin or we enter those conversations through um, very specific times and places that 
say something about who, what we bring you know, to the I, it, discussion. It may be a little simplistic. Some may, people may think it's pedestrian. I fundamentally believe that uh, one of the most important things we can do is to create environments where young people have an opportunity to build cross-racial, cross-cultural, cross cross and cross-national friendships. Uh, I think that if we do not instill a sensibility in young people, and I'm talking about people at the teenage years, at the college years, in the young professional ranks, a sensibility and an understanding to get to know people beyond stereotypes, beyond perceptions, beyond predispositions, beyond learning, then it is so much more difficult later on to do. Uh, and I think that we have to build, uh, if you will, institutional structures and initiatives in order to be able to do that. Uh, because the dynamics of uh, the world, and look, be it, look, the dynamics of our own country are changing rapidly. The racial demographic shift uh, that is occurring uh, in the election of 2020, uh, about one third of all the voters will be non-white. In the election of 1988, that percentage was 12. Uh, so you've had a rapid shift and a rapid change in the power dynamics of the country. It forces people, and I learned this in New Orleans politics, in New Orleans politics, blacks and whites were forced initially to work together. And they were forced to work together because when African Americans first gained uh, some positions of uh, electoral success, the city was still majority white. Uh, and, and white elected officials found themselves having to run in districts where it wasn't majority African American, but African Americans are 25, 30 uh, percent of the electorate. And so it was a forcing sort of thing in the earliest of stages. Over time, it became much more natural for people to think in terms of coalitions, because the reality became that those that were successful in building these coalitions were the most successful uh, in politics. So it became sort of a, a governing rule that in order to be successful, you had to do it. But initially, circumstances forced it. Conflict forced, forced it. But then some success metrics changed, I think, some of the leadership dynamic. I'm not suggesting utopia. I'm not suggesting per perfection. I'm not suggesting even uh, uh, you know, anything other than it's an observation I've seen in my work and in my life. I want to pick up on the young people because mm -hmm. you know that's where I spend yeah, most right. of my days, uh, right? At Johns Hopkins on the Homewood campus mm -hmm. with extraordinary young people. And I had mm -hmm. an experience this past fall um, where in a seminar on the history of American law and politics, mm -hmm. I had one student, a visiting student from France, Pierre. Mm -hmm. And just the presence of Pierre in the room meant that we had to unpack and explain Lots of and Lots back of stuff. up. And then he would offer us up a different vantage point, mm -hmm. right, on many of the kinds of questions that animate US history, animate French history, and more. Um, so you're right, right, that it was something um, about that scale, though, mm -hmm. too, right, which is to say um, 16 right, young minds mm -hmm. um, exchanging ideas um, where I think we learned in the way that you describe. But I want to ask about young you, because mm -hmm. yesterday you told me something um, that I didn't expect, mm -hmm. which is that when you were a, a young person and your father began to take you on the stump, mm -hmm. to the ward, to the precincts, um, to the meetings, um, you were bored and you yeah. would rather be with your friends. Um, I, I, I think like any kid, you know, yeah. if you, my father was, uh, you know, a civil rights leader, my mother uh, was an activist, my father became, a, was a lawyer, he, he also served uh, as mayor of New Orleans uh, before I did. Uh, and when we were young, we would, I would go places with him, not because he was trying to help me learn, but because there was nowhere else for me to be, but to go hang out with him. So at ages five, six, seven, eight, nine, I'd go to these community meetings, I'd go to these places, and it'd be absolutely boring because I couldn't, you know, you're too young to really understand the conversation. When I got to be about 10, 11, and 12, uh, he got elected uh, when I was 10 to the legislature, and I would go to the legislature, 
uh, and spent a week or two with him in the legislature. And I was old enough that it started to click and make sense in terms of what was really going on. Uh, and I remember being a boy uh, in the legislature when they debated such things as sex education in schools. This is 1969, 1970 in the Louisiana legislature. Uh, I remember my father had a bill uh, that uh, delabeled blood. Louisiana had a law at that point in time where blood had to be labeled as black O positive, white O positive, and it was illegal to give a transfusion to a black person with white blood, quote unquote, or a black person uh, with white blood. Uh, and uh, he had a, a bill to delabel it, uh, and it turned into a really nas national story because one of the members of the legislature jumped up uh, in the debate and started using the, the most worse and awful profanity right, against the bill. So things began to click at that age, and so that exposure, uh, which, uh, you know, and so I think kids sometimes, when you're exposed, they're going to either love it or they're going to resent it, or they're going to love it, or they're going to hate it, particularly if their parents are compelling it, right? Uh, but for me, I, 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 I wouldn't trade even those days of going to those NAACP meetings, those political meetings, uh, even when I was bored for anything in the world, because finally you get older and it begins to click. And so the point really is, uh, you know, to everyone, we have to expose to the best of our ability our young people. Uh, to things that adults do. For example, this is a powerful dialogue in here. Uh, I think uh, this sort of dialogue, I think, including students, college students, high school students, giving them an opportunity to sense what happens, what goes on when people have a conversation about serious issues and serious matters. I think cross-national and cross-cultural dialogues, I don't think we can do enough of that. Uh, because I think in the long run, it will pay off. Uh, I think sometimes when you get to be a young adult, uh, sometimes your, your, your views have become baked. Your positions have become sort of concretized. Uh, you become rigid sometimes. And sometimes you can become rigid and you believe your rigidity is a function of passion. And you, miss, you, you, you lose the distinction between what is a value and what is ideology and what is a tactic and what is just a point of view in the whole conversation. So exposing people you know, at a younger age, particularly because we have in the United States, we've got demographic change. Uh, the technological world is bringing us closer together. The globalization of the economy uh, is bringing us uh, in a, in a uh, creating a different set of environments that that's something we have to invest in in young minds and in their views and in their beliefs and and not just let's tell them create experiential opportunities for them you know um, one of the things you do um, along this journey is something I did too, which is you go to law school. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but um, I consider myself sort of the, you know, just young enough, um, but just old enough to be um, catching that tail, the civil rights era. Right. And I went to law school thinking I would change the world, mm -hmm. right? That that was a way um, to a kind of justice. and. You know, figures like Thurgood Marshall and Constance Baker Motley. Giants. Mm, giants. giants. They loom giants. large. Um, but we're both lapsed lawyers. I'll just put that on Recovering the table. lawyers. <laughs> Recovering, Recovering lawyers. lawyers. That's fair enough. But you did something impressive. You went and got a PhD. You've yeah. become a distinguished scholar. Uh, that's right so back at little you. bit. Right back uh, at you. That's not being a lapsed lawyer. But here's the thing. I think that... Um, I'm really not lapsed at all in the way I think. Mm -hmm. And that one of the things I learned in law school, but in law practice, was to come at every question 16 ways or 1,600 ways. That that was the way, and it still is the way, my mind works when I get into a room, right, and we've got a problem, we have a question. Um, and that there's nothing dishonest um, about that sort of exercise, which is to examine something 
from all points of view. And I wonder if you still feel the influence, if, if you feel like your law I training was, was that influence. I was absolutely influenced to be a change agent and a social engineer. That's why I wanted to go to law school. Uh, my father was a civil rights lawyer. All of his friends who were mentors of mine were civil rights lawyers, whether it was Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, Connie Motley, uh, uh, you know, Bob Carter, uh, in my own hometown, people like Alexander Pierre Turo, these giants were change agents. They brought about the change and they opened the doors th through which we walked because they brought the school desegregation lawsuits. They brought the lawsuits to desegregate public accommodations uh, in the South uh, in the 1950s and in the 1960s. Uh, and, and law teaches you because the fundamentals of law, at least in the United States, uh, one of the fundamentals is to learn the adversarial process. And you can't be effective in the adver adversarial process unless you know the other side's arguments. And so lawyers are sort of trained to think that way. And sometimes I think that way when I am coalition building or working to coalition build. I've got to figure out what the other party may see as a winning proposition. Uh, what the other party's animating or driving interests are. I've got to know that or I'm not going to be able to have a really meaningful and effective dialogue if I just dismiss, even if I disagree, dismiss their views, passions, values, ideology, or even their stubbornness. You've you got to understand that going in uh, to the conversation. And, and to me, being a lawyer has helped me to think on that basis uh, and, and, and a way to think in politics, a way to think about business, a way to think about how to, how to move a process, uh, and obviously how to move what I feel passionate about and what my values are and what my agenda is and understanding sometimes that, you know, yeah, I want to win the day, win the battle, win the cost, effectuate my passions or my ideology. Uh, but in some instances and sometimes, you know, to get there, I may have to go indirectly. Uh, I may have to go incrementally. Uh, I may not be able to win uh, all at once. And so that's a, you know, that's a learning process, I think, that comes in. I think being a lawyer, for me, it was, it was helpful uh, to, to get that training. You know, I, I was also a litigator and yeah. um, one of the things that's very hard to explain to people is how um, we spend the morning in a courtroom and we are passionate, we are high stakes, we are duking it out. Um, and then we break and we go to lunch. Yeah, right. And um, that is very hard, frankly, to um, explain to my colleagues mm. in academia, mm -hmm. which is to say we can disagree deeply, but then we break bread. Um, and we continue the debate, um, and we build relationships, yeah. right? So that the next time we meet one another, we are not starting from scratch. We're starting from a kind of knowingness, which means maybe I settle the next case mm -hmm. and I don't actually have to go the distance, right, right. To, to trial. And so, you know, when you think about it in, in today's context, the, the, uh, the challenges that the world faces internationally, uh, the conflicts and the crises, or you think about it, uh, you know, within uh, the United States, uh, you know, it, 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 sometimes I feel it demonstrates how far we really have to go, uh, how difficult and how challenging these times are, uh, because these distinctions and differences play out. In the United States, it plays out, uh, you know, in a racial dimension. It plays out in a religious dimension. It plays out in the United States now on issues of gender, gender equality, gender identity. It, it plays out in the United States uh, on a generational level. And in the United States, it also plays out more than ever before, although this has always been more present than people want to acknowledge, on a geographic level. Uh, the sense in the United States by people who may live in the South uh, or in the Midwest that, quote, uh, the East Coast controls the country or the West Coast controls the country, which creates a sense of, and you heard it in the previous conversation, uh, not you and I, 
but us against them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and those, the, those fissures and those divisions in the United States have become much more pronounced. And we have to understand that in a system of majority rule, division can win an election. Uh, dividing people and firing people up and inflaming them uh, is, can be a winning proposition. You can motivate people by articulating what they're against. Sometimes, and this is more the case of, of Barack Obama, you can motivate people based on some aspirational goal. But we shouldn't be naive uh, to understand that uh, di and division can sometimes be cloaked in uh, I'm not appealing to division, I'm trying to appeal to people's values and sensibilities. You know, in the United States, unfortunately, fear sells, hate sells. Uh, there's a whole industry in the United States of talk radio uh, that's predominant in places like the Midwest and the South, that if you turn it on, you will hear an endless litany of fear-mongering, uh, hating, uh, paranoia, conspiracy theory, uh, and when you listen to it, it sounds so, you know, so well-spoken and so well-researched, but when you step away from it, you realize it's one of the worst forms of propaganda that exists, you know, in our country today, but it's real, and uh, it is consumed by a lot of people uh, a lot of the time in certain regions of the country. Well, you know, I spent 16 years um, from 2001 to 2017 living in the state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And what I tell my friends back east is it was the best political education I could have ever yeah. had, right? Because there's Detroit and then there's Michigan. <laughs> thank you. And, um, and there we were, right, at the yeah. center of yeah. so many of the issues that vex the country. Yeah. Um, the decline of manufacturing, the, uh, uh, the infrastructure challenges of cities. Uh, the largest community of people from the Middle East yes, in the world. Right. In Dearborn, right? outside like of the that. Middle yeah. East, outside of the Middle East itself. Um, it was an extraordinary political education that I never could have had had I stayed in New York. Well, that's, you know, the, the, the United States is a extremely pluralistic, multicultural, and, and I like to use the term multicultural, and, and I think, and, you know, uh, Mandela and his words, uh, you know, continue to be an inspiration to so many of us, uh, but uh, what we are trying to do in the United States, the way I look at it at least, is we're trying to build a 21st century multicultural democracy multi-religious, multicultural democracy. It is not easy to do uh, because we, as, uh, as uh, the earlier panel said, we never reconciled in the correct way uh, the issues of slavery and then what I call slavery light, which was a system of American apartheid or segregation. We never completely reconciled it, right? And because we never completely reconciled it, we're trying now when the demographics of the country are no longer just dominantly black and white, but now a growing Latino, uh, Asian, and other communities that are growing uh, in size uh, at a greater rate than either the white or the black population. So it becomes a mixture, it becomes a gumbo, it becomes a mosaic, uh, and within all of that, you're trying to build a country where people feel they have a seat at the table, a say in what goes on, an opportunity for meaningful prosperity. Uh, and that's the goal, and that's the challenge for 21st century America. You know, America is an amalgamation of almost, uh, you know, not only 50 states, but multiple diasporas and multiple communities, but it's on top of this foundation of a several hundred year legacy of slavery and segregation. And you can never ever, you know, move, remove that from the equation because it was so defining of the country's wealth, the country's power dynamic and its politics. It's helping people to understand it and helping people, how can we turn in a way that understands that what we are trying to build is different from the past, right? Different from the past 
but we have to understand the past. And so to me, that's the, 20, the 21st century imperative uh, for the United States. A country uh, will, will, will celebrate our 250th birthday, mm -hmm. you know, in uh, 2026. It's going to be a time where people are going to look back. Uh, they're going to really look forward. And I really wonder, you know, and ask myself, where will we be as a nation uh, and what will we what will be thinking and what will we be looking at and will it be a time of great celebration a time of great consternation a time where we feel we've made uh, tremendous progress or a time when people feel that we're reversing course I'm supposed to move us we've got some questions the question let's go see what the audience thinks uh, so while I am um fiddle with this device. New stuff? Let me ask you one more thing. Yeah, you can't let me raise it. Because there was something you said to me yesterday at lunch that really stuck with me that I think goes to this matter, right, of who are we becoming and sort of are we ready for 2026 and what lies beyond. And what you lamented, I think, uh, it was a lament, was what you called conversations of conventionalism. Right, this notion that some of us are coming of age politically in a very narrow band, right, yeah. of this very complex picture that you've just I, painted. I used it, you know, in, in many respects, people, this is in, in leadership positions uh, in the United States, and, and we, we use, I used it to talk about many of the corporate executives sometimes that I may come into contact with, and that is uh, they may have a, a broad world view, but they don't have broad world experiences, meaning uh, they have sort of grown up and lived their life in a, in a lane of limitation, right? But it's a lane of limitation at the top of the food chain. Uh, and so the experiences of average people, the real experiences, this idea that you have people who really can't pay their rent, really can't put the money together to live from uh, month to month, uh, is uh, something that may be understood intellectually, but not really understand in the gut in terms of what that really means. And so I think it's, it's this, this, this view that I have that if you're in a leadership position, you have to force yourself to be exposed. You have to force yourself out of your comfort zone. You have to go and learn by listening and hearing. We talk about listening, we talk about listening to people. Sometimes it comes in a non-structured environment, particularly if you're in a leadership position of an institution, uh, uh, a business, uh, 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 an academic. You have, to, you have to force yourself sometimes out of your own conventionalism, your comfort zone, because I guarantee you when you do that, it, you're going to learn from it. You're going to be sensitized to it. You're going to have a better understanding of, uh, of, uh, of what it is. And, and, I, and I really feel that uh, it, it's an important thing that we, we've got to do. That plus this real focus on the next generation. Uh, and I think institutions and I think uh, the institute that's being built here uh, has a tremendous sort of uh, runway in front of it to play a role in doing this within the United States, even internationally, that I think would be very, very welcome and would, I think would pay long-term dividends. Our folks on the iPad want yeah. us to uh -oh. drill in a little bit. Okay, let's, so, let's go. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put out something that we've not talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and the question begins with a, a deep admiration for um, Dr. King and mm -hmm. the civil rights legacy um, and juxtaposes that against um, police violence oh, in yeah. the United States. And how, I might ask you, um, do we hold those sorts of, on the one hand, values and the other hand, experience um, together. I heard yesterday on this stage um, the strong suggestion, right, that we don't all have access, right, to the public sphere um, in the same ways. And this question, right, points us to one of those divisions and distinctions and along and between us. The
police violence issue in the United States is the failure, the failure of the American justice system to hold police officers who kill unarmed black men accountable consistently. The failure to hold them accountable. So it creates a sense that uh, there's not a, if you will, uh, presumption of innocence. There's an absolute standard of innocence that if you kill a young black man, you probably had to do it. Uh, and that is a, 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 a gnawing thing. But let me juxtapose that with my own experience because I fixed a broken police department in New Orleans in the 90s. We had a record level of uh, civil rights complaints, record level of corruption, and we changed it. And we changed it because we had a zero tolerance policy. I didn't care if a police officer was prosecuted by the DA, they were gonna be fired. One thing was sure is that if they engaged in corruption or brutality, they were going to lose their job. Uh, and, and I think that more uh, elected officials in the system uh, has to put its foot down. That is the problem, and it is a problem. Look, we have a 17-year-old son. He's of age where he wants to go out on a town, he wants to go out in his, with his friends, and, and, and whenever he's out, even though I know he's responsible, I know where he is, I'm nervous. I'm on edge. That something could happen, that some encounter could happen, that it could go wrong. And so for, for many of us, it's not just a news story or some, it's a personal thing, uh, you know, where uh, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you just can't countenance it. It is a problem needing a solution. Now, what, can, what needs to happen? Uh, there needs to be a change in the law that strengthens the accountability and the standards where you don't have to demonstrate an intent uh, to, in effect, uh, violate someone's civil rights. And the United States justice system has been an absolute failure when it comes to holding police officers accountable for misconduct uh, and brutality. And uh, we, we have not reconciled it. And, and let me say this, this is, this is see, this is what uh, people need. So in the Michael Brown instance, the Trayvon Martin Ferguson, instance. Ferguson, Missouri. Right. Uh, the Freddie Gray instance. Baltimore. You go back to 1967, Detroit. 1965, Watts. 1970 Newark and you look at instances of uprisings every single one of them was triggered by an act of police violence an act of police violence and so you can't say let's do you have to confront the triggering point and the triggering point is I think the failure of the system to hold police officers accountable. You know, it's deeper than that if you want to be systematic, but that's the linchpin. So I hear two things, um, at least two things. Um, and one is um, this question of a federal constitutional standard, right? And, and that is one piece of it. But what I also hear, right, is a question about um, local law and politics and practice. Um, about our cities, one of our questioners wants to sort of you to know, talk more about cities because, um, and to drill in a little bit more into this experience in New Orleans. I want to understand, you know, where was the police union, right? Where so what does that look so like in, in New in Orleans? That moment? The police union was defanged, and I'll tell you why the police union was defanged. The police union was defanged in 1979 because a year after my father took office the police union staged a police strike during the Mardi Gras season mm. and they made a terrible mistake my father effectively outmaneuvered them and got them to go back to work without a collective bargaining agreement and effectively crushed the union since then there's been no collective bargaining agreement with police officers in New Orleans in 30 years. 
I had to deal, the police, quote, so-called union, still functions as an employee association. Uh, and I, uh, uh, quite candidly, just took the position. Uh, and I tell this little story. Uh, when I was running for office, I was running for mayor, I went before the Police Association of New Orleans, uh, and they had both candidates come before them in the finals. They brought you into a room where there were all police officers. You couldn't bring an assistant, you couldn't bring an aide, you couldn't bring any staff. They closed the door. They gave you 10 minutes to talk, then they interrogated you. Uh, like you in front of a grand jury. One guy asked me, he stood up, he says, and I had had a history, I was a civil rights lawyer, I had filed lawsuits against the police department for police brutality. I knew that the police association was not gonna endorse me. One guy asked me, and this, this was really the point. He said, I wanna know one question from you. I got one question. Will you back us? Will you back us? I said, here's my answer. When you're right, I'll back you. When you're wrong, I'm not with you. He said, we don't need you when we're right. We need you when we're wrong. Mm. And I basically said, okay, well, that's not me. I walked out of there to the television cameras and I said that the Police Association of New Orleans is the biggest obstacle to reform. So if you want to reform the New Orleans Police Department, you got to vote against their candidate because what they want is someone who's going to protect the status quo. Uh, I didn't have to deal with that. And there also was, this is interesting, in New Orleans, it was a different situation because we had corrupt white officers, we had corrupt black officers. What it did was, it took a little bit of the racial lens off of the reform movement. Because it meant that when you talked about cleaning up corruption and bad cops, it wasn't just white officers, it wasn't just black officers. And that was something, a set of circumstances that was handed to me, and I understood the dynamics of the city, that when you talk about police officers and firefighters, or teachers in a city like New Orleans, everybody is one step removed, that's your cousin, that's your in-law, that's your classmate, that's your church member, that's your neighbor. And so you're not just, it becomes personal more than it just becomes, oh, those officers over there, or those police officers over here. And so to clean it up, it gave a sense, I, I got a different kind of a momentum in building a coalition. It didn't take it because the victims of the corruption and many of the victims of the brutality were African American, but it took a little bit of the edge off of the push to really clean the place up, reform it substantially, so you were firing white officers, you were firing black officers, uh, you weren't firing all white officers, you weren't firing all black officers, so I think those were some of the dynamics that helped. And just one thing about city governments, in the real scheme of things, uh, for the for the day-to-day -day existence of people in many places in the United States, who the mayor is, is sometimes more important who the president is in terms of day-to-day -day decisions. And, and, and I believe that mayors can make, and local governments and city governments and can make a huge difference in the quality of life in cities. It's better if there's a partnership with governors. It's better if you have the support of the federal government, particularly because of the federal, federal role in building an economy, the federal role in supporting what local communities want to do, but that local government is crucially important uh, to the way people live. So I'm going to wrap us up, but before We're I done. do, I get one more question. Because right. this is, um, you know, what strikes me um, in getting to know you mm -hmm. are two things. Um, one is your um, sort of infinite curiosity. Right, which I think we need, right, in this context of thinking about difficult dialogues. We need, we must be curious, we must be interested. Um, and it is mixed with a kind of, um, can I say the word optimism? Mm -hmm. um, so can you just talk about sort of how you keep that part of your, you've seen so, a lot. You know, because. <laughs> you, you know a lot, you might be somewhat I'll cynical. I'll tell you, because we talked about uh, him earlier on the earlier panel, 
How can we not be optimistic when a Nelson Mandela can spend 27 years in prison and come out of that experience with his mind, body, soul, and spirit intact to such an extent that he could become the nation's president? How can we not have hope when we hear the experiences of a John Lewis who got his head beat in on the bridge at Selma, just one example. How can we not have hope when we see a guy like the late John McCain, whose politics I didn't always agree with, spent five years as a prisoner of war and can emerge from that experience with his mind and soul, he had some physical ailments intact to be able to contribute to the discourse in this country. How can we not have hope when uh, people from all walks of life, you know, work 12 hours a day and ride public transit uh, back and forth? Uh, we owe it uh, to the future to be hopeful, to be optimistic, and to fight the, the guardians and the purveyors of gloom and doom. And, you know, I just think being curious is just being interested in the world around you and no one should ever feel that they know everything and no one should ever feel that, uh, you know, they, they're not going to evolve in their perspective and their views. Pity the fool mm. who at the age we are, we won't tell, is the same person they were in every single respect 35 years ago, then you know what that says? You have not lived. You've not lived a day in your life. It's a perfect note for us to end on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all so much. Um, and now please welcome our final discussion of the day, uh, offering perspectives on an issue being debated around the world right now, and this is the issue of refugee integration. Um, moderating our discussion will be Michelle Miller, who is the co-host of CBS This Morning Saturday, and she will be joined by Munzer Khattab, um, born in Syria, now living in Germany, and the co-founder of Bureau Crazy, um, an app to help uh, immigrants around the world integrate into their new communities. Um, Mike Nickenchuk, who is a neuroscientist and researcher who has spent a career um, understanding uh, the plight of refugees and the communities into which they integrate. And Barry Shorey, who is the Senior Technical Director of Economic Recovery and Development at the International Rescue Committee. Uh, Barry has also spent a career around the world understanding these issues. Um, as, as before, this panel will take questions at the end, so please make sure to submit your questions um, and feel free to tweet along as well at hashtag SNF Dialogues. Uh, welcome to our final panel. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate that, because we're here to talk about something that I think everyone from every nation understands or should. 70.8 million. Number of displaced people. Poverty, war, famine, and soon climate change impacts on these people moving, migrating, being ripped apart from their nations, their communities, and their people. There's an impact to them. There's an impact to the communities who choose to welcome them. There is an impact to those who choose to neglect them. And there's a cost. Euros. 
there is a cost in brain power. There is a cost in our health. There is a cost of the heart. They know all about it. They know all about it. So Mike Munzer, my dear friend Barry, talk about what keeps you all up at night. The cost of the refugee crisis. And I'm going to drop the mic. Um, thanks, Michelle. Uh, we, we promised we'd shake it up a little bit on the last panel. Just so I think uh, Michelle's sort of calling us to action here. So I just want to give just a quick big overview, and then uh, Munzer and Mike uh, definitely can drill down a bit. But I think important with that 70.8 million number that we just reached a few weeks ago um, is what's happening around what my boss, uh, David Miliband, our CEO, calls the age of impunity. And a real sort of, we are at a time in more displaced in the world since World War II. Um, civil wars are three times as deadly as interstate wars, four times as long. 60% um, of conflicts that started in the early 2000s have every five years sort of reignited. Um, and I think, you know, refugees displaced, they're not returning, less than 3% last year. And so I think it's just important to note, you know, what keeps me up at night is the fact that we need solutions, we need thoughtful ideas, um, we need people like Mike and Munzer and the people that I work with worldwide um, really looking at, you know, as governments are retreating, uh, the US and the UK certainly retreating, uh, what does it mean to sort of uh, innovate, to work uh, in this space? And so, you know, what keeps me up at night is that it's not going away, uh, people are sort of retreating from, from responsibility and accountability, and what, how can we then uh, take that place? For Munzer, yep. it, it literally is. It's a very literal meaning. It's yeah. not just figurative. That's correct, actually. Like, it's what's keeping me up at night that I have this constant feeling that I have to do something, right? Because I am in Germany right now, but there is every day laws that comes and goes. Like, there is a lot of politicians that speaks about refugees, and we, we need to send them back. So I have this kind of feeling of instability unsta every single day, which is literally just keeping me up at night. I'm not stable, I'm not happy, I'm not, like, I feel this constant feeling that I need to do something, which is, I'm, like, I'm trying to do every single day. Which and, is, and you have. There, which is, you have, he has literally created an app for that. Quite literally. Which, Euro, Euro. Crazy. That is true. So what we're trying to help, like we're trying to do, is help out uh, the refugees and the newcomers that they came, at least to Germany for now, um, fill out papers, um, because it's a great deal. Like, it's a great deal in Germany, because you have every day, every single day, you need to deal out with papers that you don't understand the language for, even they have a special language for the office language. Um, you have special language, you have a lot of complex situations, like I have literally just submitted a paper yesterday, I called my brother, hey, I will give you $50 if you do it, and I did give him $50, so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of like, it's a lot of work that you need to do in order to keep yourself back, and like in Germany, like you need to deal with the bureaucratic system, you need to work, you need to prove yourself, you need to study, you need to learn the language. It's every, it's so heavy on us, like it's so stressful. You need to find an apartment, like I'm leaving my apartment and the, in the end of this year and they have, until now, no other option. No other option. Absolutely not. What, what, this is also Germany, a, a place that has welcomed refugees, that has a path to work, has actual open jobs. And so imagine sort of Munzer's stress, which I'm sure uh, Mike can talk about, in a place that's actually welcoming versus a lot of the other contexts that IRC works, which isn't the case yet. What, what does that stress look like? I mean, because it's not just the stress of this, the stress of this, it is the stress of all. I mean, it, there is a physical toll. No one really 
prepares you for what a war is going to feel like. No one prepares you for what it's going to be like to pick up that bag, shut the door, and never see that room again. You don't know when that memory of that room, the smell, the paint on the walls, when that's going to attack you in the moments when you feel safe. And it's going to not remind you of that sense of peace and comfort of home. It's going to remind you of the loss, that you don't have that. Forced displacement, whether it's because of climate, because of conflict, because of uh, domestic violence, whatever it might be, forced displacement is embodied at the cellular level. It affects the production of your DNA. It's literally encoded on your DNA in a way that is passed down to subsequent generations that could, in certain environments, predispose your children to depression and to other mental health symptoms. Did, did everyone hear that? I, I have to hear you. Did you, you got that, right? It has a physical, physical toll on our body. And, you know, I spent most of the past seven years working between Jordan and, and Lebanon, especially in Zaptiri refugee camp on the border of Jordan and Syria. And one of the most challenging things, and this goes back to the question of what keeps me up at night, is that there's a, there's a certain lie that I believed as well that I as an American citizen, as someone who can travel freely, as someone who, in the eyes of every refugee that I have befriended, oh, I gotta befriend this guy, he can help me in some way. I can't. You know, I can in my context as a neuroscientist, as a researcher of someone who works in mental health programming, but to think that me or Barry, as privileged Westerners, can change a damn thing about those systems, that requires a lot of coalition building that is far beyond one or two or three humanitarian agencies. So. You know, it's, it's when people even are in these places of a refugee camp or Greece or Germany or the United States or Canada, and I'm thinking even to my native Guatemala, which had a massive displacement crisis in the 80s as well. You know, this stuff lingers. My mom left her country because of a conflict as well. And it affected the way that she raised me. It affected her traits of anxiety. And one of the hardest things is not knowing how to get out of that, knowing that war and displacement have changed you. I, have be, I, I am different than who I was before because of this, and I still don't know how to get out of it. So that cycle doesn't end just because someone finds a safe place, quote unquote. The effects linger for a long time, and that poses so many challenges to integration. Speaking, speaking to that, Barry, I, yeah. I, I was talking to them about how they got into um, the space that they're now in, and, and Barry said, I kind of stumbled into it. And what she realized, what I realized talking to her is like, uh, no, it is in your DNA, as, as Mike just sort of illustrated to yeah. us. Um, I, yeah, I've been sort of working at IRC for over 13 years. Um, and, and again, having thought, I, I, I stumbled into it, but have, IRC was started um, and founded by taking Jews out of, out of Europe and, uh, during the Holocaust. And so that's, that's the history of my family as well. Um, and just sort of speaking to Mike and, and knowing what, you know, histories of refugees of displaced have gone through and knowing the sort of brain and, and the cellular level changes and then the asks that Munzer was talking about, about paperwork, about, uh, you know, uh, getting an ID, about trying to navigate new labor markets with very little social networks. And, and so knowing how deep, how hard those things are for those of us that have that haven't been changed, that haven't been, uh, um, um, and it sort of reminded me of, of of what a lot of you know my family had been through, but just how difficult uh, um, it is, and sort of the the credit that we have to give around not just you know figuring out how to navigate these hard systems, but while also having sort of deep trauma and and and, and things like that. So yeah. Well, I think talking about, like Mike, as Mike said and as Barry said, that, that we have trauma that like affects our lives today, even like even in the years or like after even after we left. Like yet, when I arrived to Athena, like yesterday or the day before, I wander on the streets, and I remembered when I came here four years ago searching for a hotel room just to stay for six hours, just to like take this warmth and sleep at night. Like I just went to every hotel offering them as much money as they want. They didn't accept me whatsoever. And it's ironic, but then like now in my hotel room there is four different body lotions, which is like, it's ironically funny that 
what's happened in these four years? Why four years ago nobody accept me into sleep just one night and now there is someone opening the door, the taxi door for me? What, what changed? What changed for that person checking you in? Was it the credit card? I have a paper. I just, I, ha I just have my ID on me and that's it. That's everything that changed me. Like I have longer beer, but that's, <laughs> that shouldn't be affected that I cannot sleep it like at the, take like at least in a bed for six or eight hours. I, I, I think about the cost to you and uh, the impact on you, but I'm looking at that much larger social network because it is beyond, you know, the individual. Um, and it reminds me of something Mike said, <clears throat> and he says, we know that integration is not easy. Being a host country is not easy. And we need to openly explore issues of trauma, belonging, and fear from both sides. There is a logic and a predictability to the current situation. Yeah, I'm, we, we can't pretend that we've never had integration crises before. I mean, the United States is an example of a country built on the notion of, of creating something new. In, in Latin, I know we're in Greece, sorry to bust out Latin. Um, it, it comes from the word integrare, or integer, it's to make something whole. And from a scientific perspective, the process of integration starts first and foremost with working to make people whole again, and that is a lifelong process, while also admitting that for countries who are receiving refugees in ma massive numbers, or in other cases having crises without having massive numbers. I mean, compare Lebanon, one in six people is a refugee, um, and it's still a semi-functioning state. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who aren't whole themselves and who are already feeling excluded from the societies that they're in, and now they're expected to receive refugees. And it's not fun to watch people who aren't you, you're struggling making 500 euro a month, and you're watching someone getting state aid, because of what exactly? It's hard to do that calculus. And they I'm, live the same dynamic in some circumstances. Violence, yeah. yep. conflict. Uh, um, having a lack of state services for them. There's certain areas of Germany that have certainly faced that, rural areas of Germany that feel that they're very disconnected from decisions made in Berlin. And uh, none of this is to justify racism or xenophobia or you know, anti-migrant sentiment, but to say that a, a scared brain is rarely a rational one. And so we can have conversations ad nauseum about increasing empathy. And unless you are also trying to dismantle structures that make host countries so easily afraid and the social and economic inequalities that are causing that fear of the other, we're not going to have any, any progress in terms of integration of migrants or creating something new. Yeah, it's interesting. I was watching television uh, this morning, and the Treaty of Versailles was very much was the whole documentary on the Treaty of Versailles and um, Woodrow Wilson and the carving up of the Middle East. And I'm curious from an historic standpoint, you know, how we got here. Are we, are we talking a millennia? Are we talking the last 100 years? I mean, our migration pattern in terms of refugees and displaced people is at a record high. The, the root causes are historic, but, but there's something going on right now. And if it were one or two things from your perspectives, because you got it in the United States, even though we don't call it a refugee crisis, you got it in, you know, in, the, in the Middle East, in various countries, you certainly have it in Africa, Venezuela, you have it all over the map. What's going on right now that has changed our mental capacity uh, and how we view people in trouble. Quickly, I would just say that things that are different now than 50 years ago are the levels of inequality. I mean, sure, climate change, we can talk about that later. The levels of inequality and the technological access to view that inequality in your face every single day. There will be people that are migrating because of conflict and war. That will continue so long as there's conflict and war. We also have to expect migration based on inequality so long as that's not addressed. Because so long as I'm sitting in Congo, I'm sitting in Senegal, and I can see what my cousin, who for whatever dumb luck got a, 
a residency permit in Canada, I see what he has, I am going to move towards that. Unless we either change inequality or human nature, we're not going to change the migration question. Barry? Yeah, I would definitely agree with what Mike was saying. I think, again, also back to this sort of accountability or focus on, on uh, uh, you know, international rights, international law, humanitarian work has also sort of disrupted. Um, in the early, you know, right after the Cold War, there was a real sense of sort of human rights and, and, and uh, sticking up for that. And, and, and I think we've, we've lost that over the last years. And, and there is a, a real sense that, you know, people can act with impunity and, and armed groups and civil, and civil wars can sort of happen and, and nothing really comes to mind. I was, I was in Niger uh, a couple weeks ago visiting our, working on our programs there um, that support uh, livelihoods for, for refugee and internally displaced communities. And we, you know, aid workers came under attack. We lost two staff at the IRC. Uh, so I think it's just really important to pull out that in addition to what Mike is saying, there's just a lack of care and accountability and uh, a, a retreat. Um, and so that also compounds things quite a bit as well. Okay, so let's, let's flip the script here. We need some social cohesion. We need some opportunities for dialogue. We need to change the dynamic. And I know we're saying, you know, uphill battle. How do we begin the process or the continuum through what you all are doing here? Is it direct services? Is it understanding the mental and emotional toll? Take me there. Well, in my opinion, I think the first thing that we need to do here is just to change the word integration into including. Just instead of saying that refugees have to integrate into the German or the whatever society they are in, they have to be included even in the decision making. I think nobody understands refugee more than a refugee himself and Mike because he's living. And Mike. <laughs> he's living about the brain. Um, he's He's um, the kind of guy, like, he has a conversation, actually, with refugees. He has friends, close friends. He, I'm, I'm close friends with Mike, and I think people need to learn this, need to learn how to talk with us, like, because we are, at the end, we're normal human beings. We have our, like, our own life that you all have. We eat, drink, and then we have the same topics that we talk about. So have a normal conversation. That's really important, and including us, even in the political um, decision-making. Because if you call it crisis, I don't see the crisis, because in my opinion, the crisis here is the other community is not accepting that there is new people coming. Oh my God, they will change everything. They will change our, they will take our jobs. And this is absolutely not correct, because I think, in Germany at least, after the refugee crisis, if you want to call it, there is more jobs than ever. Like in this, in 2019, there is more than 700,000 open jobs in Germany alone, and this is a huge number. There is a lot of people that are so unfilled, we, right? Right. Aging right. workforce. Yes. And, and that was caused by the fact that more people came into the country. No, it's country? saying that there's gap. There's a gap, right? where a lot of sort of the rhetoric around refugees is, oh, they're taking our jobs. Well, actually in Germany, there's 700,000 of them open, so. But you yeah. also have a population yep. issue because yep. the current yep. Europe, well, it's a, there's a decline going yep. on. Yep. I, I just have to go back to the point of understanding the quote unquote refugee or displaced person. Mike understands not only because he studies the brain, but because it's, it is personal to him. And there was a, an interesting point that you made for you to like enter into this space. You had to answer a vital question for yourself because of what happened with Tooth Friends. Yeah, it's, this is the, the, the what keeps us up at night questions. Um, a dear friend of mine, Mohammed, he tried to commit suicide, not because of what he saw in Syria, but because of what life was like being a refugee. Uh, another friend that I lost to a, you know, a long battle with addiction, not because of what happened in Syria, but because of what life was like as a refugee. 
So the, the narrative of trauma, the narrative of stress, kind of starts with war. It doesn't start and end with that. And, you know, thinking of their journey towards integration, absolutely what they needed was to become whole in a place that they felt safe. Uh, that's what, they, what they need is not something unfamiliar, it's what every single one of us needs to find a place where we feel safe and can be made whole. Safety in the sense of economic security, of freedom from having a bomb dropped on your head, freedom from being raped, freedom from whatever abuses you might have been experiencing in your home country. And every you know, advance in brain science and understanding what's going on to a person who's experienced trauma, there's faces and there's an urgency to that because the number of refugee suicides in Germany, in Greece, in Jordan, all around the world is really high. Um, we don't care when they drown, we definitely don't care when they commit suicide. Um, so there's an urgency to answering questions from a scientific perspective because people are dying, people that I love have the risk of taking their own lives because of what this journey has done. And none of this is to create a sob story that makes people just be sad about it to the point of, you know, not admitting the political realities. The, the truth is, yeah, as migration continues, as people suffer mental health challenges as a result of that migration, there are security implications, there are cultural implications. The urban United States looks very different now than it did 30 years ago. What percentage of Latinos now in the United States? You know, the, the United States will soon be a non-white majority nation. So there are realities that we can be scared of them as long as we want. They're still going to happen. And I think, uh, you know, as Ibrahim said, said earlier, it's not going away. People aren't going to go away. And how long are people going to suffer until we just accept that? What, you, what you're saying is with the successes in, in the United States, at least, um, from a political aspect um, in particular, is that once the successes of inclusion happen, uh, the rules get changed. So w what's working? What can continue to work? And, and how do you sort of not, like, so fear is the ultimate enemy here, right? So how do you sort of make people feel that, like, the fear is decimated or at least lessened and people are able to create success without the rules of the game being changed to again uh, give the upper hand to the majority I mean, or, I, and just the majority yeah I mean I think we all come out uh, from slightly different perspectives. You know, my tendency in my work has been all on the sort of uh, economic empowerment side of things and looking at uh, the role that jobs and labor market integration can play, both for supporting the refugee and the displaced, but also social inclusion um, and understanding, you know, the contributions refugees can make to the economy, uh, what work means, uh, what working alongside um, uh, populations. And so I think, you know, Munzer's an amazing example of the innovation that can come um, from from refugees being allowed to work, being able, being able to access opportunities, and 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 yeah. So I know I'm sure um, Mike would come from a bit of a mental health perspective, but for me, there's a lot in there around how can we support proper labor market integration, proper access to opportunities to innovate, access to paperwork and capital, and sort of all those things that matter. Yeah. Well, I think um, like just elaborating on your point that. Like our Mike's point, that uh, the world is going like to be more open and uh, multiculti, and we need to deal with it. People who hate this need to like to find a way, one way or another, just to deal with the fact that we are going to globalization because this is the only answer that we have right now for most of the problems that we're facing, and. Believe it or not, the people who hate this, they will become a minority and they will be isolated. So they better change. I think, in my opinion, this is the only way um, that we can face the problems that we have if we're going to call most of them as a problem. But as you said, like, I mean, there is quite huge examples of success that have never 
like I've never imagined in my whole life. There is people who learned the language in two years and enter universities. And there is a person, a friend of mine that I know, went to Sweden when she was 20 years old. She finished high school at the first of, top of her class by Swedish people. There was like all Swedish people, native speakers. And they, she, after two years only, finished the language, finished the uh, high school, and top of her class. So there is this an amazing stories. There is a lot of people who have like a great mind powers. And like there is, I mean, more than 60% of the refugees that came to Europe, at least, are 30 years or younger. So all of them are ready just to like, to work, to create, to innovate. And I think this is what everyone in the world needs. I mean, if I was a country, I would love to have us as refugees. Listen to you. <laughs> Can I just really quickly on that, Michelle? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had the privilege, sad privilege, of following certain individuals from when they came from Syria and to places like Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. And then as they've been through Athens or the islands and then up into Europe, and watching that progress, you know, and there's a, there's a, I heard the same refrain so many times in, in Arabic, it's, like, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Tell me what integration means for you and I'll do it. Is it a job? Okay, I got a job. I don't feel like you treat me any differently than you did before. Is it language? I'm ready to do it. I'll do it. And so I learned the language. Hmm. This still feels the same as before. So people don't, and entire countries, whether it's a municipal level policy or national policies and strategies on integration, starts from the same flawed premise of not having a solid definition of what they mean by that word. And they keep running into the same problems of it not being enough, despite people meeting all the benchmarks that they say and still having a rise in anti-migrant sentiment. Yeah. We, we have a lot of really great questions from the audience. Um, so I want to get to them, and I want like us to be quick on these. Um, we, we haven't discussed much about the experience of those receiving refugees, especially in places of scarce resources like islands in Greece or, 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 um, or just, just here. We'll, we'll stay with Greece. Uh, racism is not justified, but do we need to acknowledge the pre-existing agony um, that exist to those communities? Yeah, I mean, pain unrecognized is gonna seethe and it's gonna turn into a cancer. If you don't clean a wound, it doesn't get better on its own, very rarely. Yeah, you gotta have a really good immune system, but countries and communities that have been isolated do not have good psychological immune systems, you could say. If you have never had your pain recognized by your state, by your county, by your European Union, and then another group comes in and is getting all this attention and money, even you're going to get the stats wrong, you're going to think they're getting more than you, and it's just going to make that wound grow. Victimhood unrecognized turns into a nasty competition, as Ibrahim said before. And that's, that's not the fault of the refugee, and it's not the fault of the people that have, by a bad luck of geography, yeah. You know, you're living in a tourist destination like Mitilini, and then all of a sudden you're at the center of the global stage who cares about you for all of five minutes. I never actually cared about you, they just cared about you because you happen to be receiving boats. And then your economy is still not doing well and you're still isolated. That is not the refugee's fault, right? Um, but it's also not yours. Yeah. And so who then does the responsibility lie on? And this is a broader policy question for the European community. Yeah. Another question. Um, last year's speaker, Harold Koppelwitz, discussed the children being separated from their parents once in the U.S. would have irreparable damage. How do we as people continue to watch this happen without expressing outrage? It will outrage do anything? It clearly hasn't in the U.S. <laughs> right. Okay, let's move on. What do you think we need to do to create a productive dialogue and effect, effective policy? On refugees. Well, I think uh, the first first thing, like um, refugees or like Syrians or everyone that in Germany is um, can register in a party, and this is like the first step. We register there, and then we kind of like uh, feel like left behind. I think here that we need to change the mentality of the people that 
we need to accept that even us as refugees, we work, we uh, get money, we participate in the taxes, we participate in the whole country, so why not participating in the, politi the political scene, right? Because that's power. That, why not? <laughs> well, I'm just saying. Like, yeah. exactly. No, 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 I understand that people like, but I don't understand why people like, um, there is a limit, you need, like there is a line, don't step even in it. I was like, no, I'm, I want to go beyond the line. I want to be in the power, even being in the power. It's fine, like it's good, it's healthy. I'll also just talk on the policy wonky side um, a bit, and I, I think speaks to Mike's like, you know, there's only so much we can do. What does the systems change? What does political change look like? Uh, there's a few things happening at, at sort of European and global levels around the sustainable development goals. Um, and and uh, big meetings happening around this, but and we've made great strides within some of these SDGs. But what has been totally left behind is refugees and crisis-affected populations. And so, uh, doing a lot of work around advocacy around what does it mean to actually reach the sustainable development goals for everyone. And then the other thing that's the other big sort of thing that's happening is the global refugee compacts. Um, so Jordan, Ethiopia, a few countries um, have been negotiated into these compacts around uh, refugee sort of uh, outputs and, and outcomes and looking at that. And so how can we really uh, uh, pressure sort of donor governments to be able to, to open up opportunities around these compacts as well? So those are just two policy bits. And, and Michelle, to be optimistic, there, there are so many great small community level dialogue initiatives and programs in Greece in Germany, in the United States, at the county and municipal level of, of communities that are yeah. receiving refugees. Yeah. So it's, it's not all, you know, yeah. blackness and darkness. It's, it, there's so many good small initiatives happening. And the truth is it's incredibly dangerous for you as a person to meet someone that you hate or have said that you have hated. So you see tremendous transformations in people when they're actually forced to be in that intimate space with someone that they profess hating. I've seen this happen with people that have been in Jabhat al-Nusra and Daesh. I've seen this happen with... Um, you know, uh, right-wing um, you know, extremists in the United States. Uh, so there's transformations that are happening. So uh, there's an interesting dynamic happening. Another question from the audience about uh, gender dynamics. And as male populations from countries that don't look at gender quite the way some other folks do, or at least the countries that they are now coming into, um, you know, what's the role of women in, in this in, in this new power dynamic as they are coming into a nation that um, has a different point of view? Um, I, I think um, I have the experience of uh, teaching in a school that in a course uh, for digital integration for women, if you want to call it integration, of course. Um, so we have the majority of the course or the uh, school are women and we're trying just to get women to work more, to empower them, just to get out of their apartment and work and introduce them to the idea that, hey, you can do something as well. So I think empowering women is happening. And then, especially like in the digital work, like where, where, I, where I work, um, being a designer or being a developer, being coder, write, uh, write a code, it doesn't matter what gender you have because all what you're doing, sitting behind a computer, code something that would be awesome in the future and release it. So I think this is like a step uh, to empowering human, uh, women. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge issue, it's sort of any... Uh, women face sort of double the challenges, double the, the, the obstacles. What's been, what was interesting in some of our work in Jordan was uh, sort of after the crisis happened and we really, you know, about a couple years deep, uh, we started to see a lot of, there were a lot of women he headed households coming from Syria, um, either because, you know, the men have died or are injured and not able to work. And so it was becoming very apparent that the women had to then become the sole bread earners. And what dynamic changes in the households and what women think of themselves. And so uh, uh, we worked a lot with uh, sort of Syrians and Jordanians around uh, what does home-based businesses look like? What does it mean for, for, for women who hadn't been active in, in markets to now become active? And the, the sort of opportunity we had with that as well to change some roles and responsibilities, yeah. I'm not really clear on this question, but maybe you guys can unpack it. Unpack it. Um, how, 
please address how to enter into productive dialogue with those who do not accept a future for their countries that is dominantly Greek, German, French, or white American. Does that make sense to you, or was it lost in translation? So, so um, address how to enter into productive dialogue with those who do not accept a future for their countries that is dominantly Greek, German, French, or white American. Uh, people who don't accept a cosmopolitan future or a multi-ethnic future yeah. for their state. The, that's not a uniquely European problem. Uh, most of my experience is in Jordan, a country that is approximately 40% Jordanian, 60% Palestinian, who are Jordanian citizens. You had a, I remember the second day I went to work in Zatari refugee camp, I went with a colleague whose father came from the West Bank into Jordan in 1967. Um, and the entire time driving up to the camp, he was saying, you know, we didn't have the UN back then, UNRWA wasn't a thing, we didn't have camps, they just came and they just had to make it work. My father had to drink his own urine for several days on end, and they first came over the border, there was no water, there was no sewage. These guys, these Syrians don't know how good they have it. So these, these problems of not, uh, not wanting these Syrians as a part of my Jordanian future, despite the fact that you're Palestinian, you know, the Six hours later, after working in the, in the camp, he came back into the car and started bawling. He started sobbing. And he said two things. He says, I am sorry for everything I said on the way here, and I need to go give my dad a really big hug. Hmm. Right? So confronting that reality, it, it's hard. And knowing that you have some unresolved pain that is unrecognized, it's going to be so hard to confront and extend any empathy, it's hard to extend something that you never received. Right. And that's going to require a tremendous effort in radical solidarity with people who we find potentially deplorable, or whatever words you want to use, of standing in radical solidarity with them, of recognizing their pain as a way to enable them to recognize the pain of others. Barry, talk to us more about the structural changes communities can make to serve better both sides. Yeah. Um, I think We've been working with the Athens municipality a lot uh, recently in, in some of the welcoming centers and, and the job uh, counselors and helping them train job counselors that support both vulnerable Greeks and, um, and refugee populations in accessing employment opportunities. I think, like Mike said, there's some really, really good examples of, of what welcoming communities look like and um, what sort of resources people bring to bear. And, a lot of it is around access to information and, and, and understanding. And so I think um, Athens, uh, Amman is, is a big example too of, of creating um, safe spaces, of creating places where you can learn about and access services, both uh, where host and refugee communities can come together. So I think we've seen really good examples at municipal levels um, and looking now to sort of expand nationally as well. I'm not sure what your experience has been with the no, no. I always say that Berlin is one of the best experience of uh, welcoming refugees or welcoming a new culture because Berlin is already have a lot of cultures, have a lot of languages. Like it's amazing that you when you go to the subway and you hear five different languages in the same place that you kind of like it's it's amazing. I think every country should learn from Berlin. Uh, I think uh, Canada, like uh, we have Toronto. I have heard some stories there. They are like. Be open-minded to the fact that there is other cultures, there is other languages. Your culture is not the best culture in the world. Your religion is not the best, is not the one. Um, your language is not the one and is not the best. Like there is other languages, there is other cultures, whether you accept it or not, and you, you need to accept it now or deal with it for the rest of your life, be isolated by... It's really interesting. I was interviewing the uh, CEO of Audible about two or three weeks ago who set up shop in Newark, but he was utilizing uh, what is taking place in Berlin. In particular, he said, the last 10 years, uh, that city has gone through an incredible, I don't want to call it a turnaround, but, but there is a symbiotic relationship between the food the music, the culture, the architecture, and the people. And it'd be interesting to note if there's an attachment to the migration of different points of view in 
helping to create a space kind of like this. Yep. You know? Um, anyway, that was just my musing to, to add to the conversation. But there was something in here that was um, new to me, and that's someone's talking about the radical new Italian bill. Are we aware of this? Okay, I'm, then I should, I'm, I'm, I should move on. So, because I, I, I don't know what that is. You don't either? Okay, good to know. Um, as I try to refresh here, uh, going back at the initial outrage question, why can't we be outraged? What's wrong with expression of outrage or being angry? Oh, I, I, think it's, I think it's very good. I just don't think it always pushes uh, elite and political will. I think it's, it's one of many important avenues because it can help build consensus around topics. It can help build consensus around hashtag me too, which was already talked about uh, yesterday or the day before. There's an absolute necessary place for outrage. Um, it was just that it, it's, there's a lot of other avenues to push the political will as well. So interesting because when I looked at the clock, we were two minutes ahead, now we're two minutes behind, or is that, no, oh, it goes red. When well, you have, yeah. When, okay, so we have a minute, 53 seconds. Yeah. Okay, here's another question. Do you think that horrific photo of the father and son who drowned trying to enter the U.S. will finally move Americans to demand reform of their immigration situation? So basically, uh, migrants, there's, the, they drowned uh, along the, I believe, the Rio Grande. Yeah. Yes. yes. Do you think that those images, kind of like the image of that that young, that baby, uh, was it Turkey or? Island Kurdish. Yes. 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 Um, do you think it, it's going to have? Is there? Is, is, is that the? I hate to use this term, but is that the sweet spot for us to get outraged to the point of change? Dead babies aren't enough. Yeah. Dead babies in rivers or the Mediterranean aren't enough. Never have been. Never will be. There's a, so many reasons why people are leaving a place like Guatemala, things from falling coffee prices to gang violence to economic inequality to domestic violence and machismo. They're going to keep coming. They're going to keep risking their lives. You can build any deterrence policy, and all that's going to happen is people are going to risk their lives in more dangerous ways to still get there. And this was happening with Obama. It was, it's happening with Trump. This isn't new. Uh, it's just the outrage has potentially shined more light on it, uh, which is important. But I don't think that'll be a turning point, no. In 15 seconds, each of you, um, where do we go from here? We're having this conversation. You have a, an audience here who are engaged, or at least moved, um, who want to be outraged, some of them, who want to be angry, because um, they, they see a way. What do they do? I think, like, first of all, have a conversation with someone. Um, like, just try to go out and talk with, like, one of us, if you want to call it. Like, I hate, I hate that kind of division between those communities. What trying actually to create here is what's happened. Like, your um, Mark was talking about uh, the division between uh, black community and white community in the U.S. We don't want this anymore. We need to stop it, so we need to be included, we need to be stop hating each other, just like have a normal conversation with normal human beings. We're not Easier said than done. Yeah. We're not scary, I swear. <laughs> I, I would just say, I made so many assumptions about what I think refugees should want when, they're, when they arrived in Jordan, when they arrived in the camp that I was working in, when they arrived in the United States. Ask Munzer what he wants and fight to help him get it. Yeah. End of discussion for that. Yeah. I mean, I would just add to, I think, you know, there's around the personal and really understanding the refugee experience and, and talking to refugees, I think also putting pressure on your governments, putting pressure on even your companies to sort of be more inclusive hiring practices and, and even sort of just saying, what does it mean to have a diverse workforce? What does it mean to be a diverse city and how do you push for that? And then, you know, vote vote uh, for, for, the, for the people and policies and practices that um, matter and that open up the space, but yeah. And just one last thing, what are the, 
how do we find those spaces with all the success stories? Those institutions, those, how do we, where do we go find them? There is a conference actually in, in like in a few weeks, it's called the uh, G100. It's about uh, the like, Syrian community who's participating in the politicians in, uh, back in Germany and then uh, working, starting startups. There is everywhere. It's like everyone in the news, just write the word um, and then you will find it if you're searching for it. Google. Yeah. Google yeah. it. Google. That's how we get here. Thank you very much. We appreciate Mike, Barry, Munster. Did I say it right? That's correct. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Michelle. So thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, the title of our um, workshop today was Talking and Listening Across Divides. So I want to say thanks to all of you for listening. Um, I hope we can continue these dialogues upstairs. Um, just after this, if you go up to 5A, which is the rooftop, uh, we would like to welcome all of you to have lunch and continue these conversations. Before we do so, um, Anna Kinthea would like to come out and tell you a little bit more about the next um, SNF dialogue, which will be taking place next month. We would like to thank all of you for being here with us today. And just to remind you that next Dialogues event, the upcoming Dialogues event, will travel to Van Vaku on July the 13th. On the occasion of the Van Vaku Revival Project, we will open up the discussion about the revitalization of rural places driven by technology, innovation, extroversion, and respect, of course, for its place and its traditions. In addition to the discussion that will take place as part of the dialogue series, visitors will also participate in a number of outdoors activities and a mountain run, and we also attend a Greek national opera concert. Thank you.